is a new version of the truth. And there's a difference there. It's actually not a version. It is the truth itself. We've worked extensively with Aboriginal people for the last decade. We've been shown sites all over the country. And slowly but surely, we've assembled a story based on science, based on archaeology, and it's not based on channeling. But what it is also based on, because whenever we go on country, we always take psyches with us because we look at both sides of the equation. It's very important we start by understanding one very important point. When you look at an archaeological site and you don't understand there's magic there, drop your clipboard and walk away because you will not get anything bar the 101. What we've done is we've gone on the site and acknowledged the magic is there and we've got the full story. And today what we're going to do is we're going to start with a new species that's been found in Australia that does rewrite world history. Um, and we're at the process now, I'm pleased to say, where the government is now backing us which is bizarre because it's the same government that sent me probably a dozen threats to be put in jail and now standing beside us. The reason they're doing that is very simply because, ladies and gentlemen, we have now constructed one of these beings and they've seen it and they gave up. They don't fight with us anymore. So we're going to start by not looking at the skulls we found by not looking at all the different stuff we've found because first of all I have to clean up some dross. I'm a high school teacher and a primary school teacher and I know what schooling is meant to do. It's most, mo meant to basically dull you down and you stop asking questions and start to memorise. So what we've got to do is we've got to clear up all the stuff you were taught at school that's wrong and then once we've done that then we can look at the skulls and the ring and the other things that come with that. But first of all, we've got to clear up some misconceptions. If you wouldn't mind, please, Evan. And that's the first one, ladies and gentlemen. When you went to school at some stage, you probably saw a diagram like this. And you were told by the gentleman out the front who had a degree in science, this is how it happens. Well, when you look at that, there's a couple of problems. And we're going to look at this first. We're going to look at a very basic problem that people never really thought about. And it goes something like this. If I was teaching or talking to a, a pack of Labradors, you'd all look the same to me. But right now, none of you look the same. And believe it or not, that's a very important point I'm going to come back to. But first up, let's look at the map. And what this basically tells us is around about here, point one, there were monkeys running around. And two mother monkeys, a mother monkey and a father monkey, decided let's have some kids and they did something different. Their kids had sutures. Now those three sutures are what makes hominins. Because Lucy's got 600 cc and you've got 1300 cc. The reason that happens is because the three bones on the top do not join straight away. Right? That's what makes a hominin. Now what they said is, that around about this stage here, that particular monkey, mum and dad decided to have kids and they weren't like the others. The tail started to pop away and they started to stand up. I'm going to call that, and you'll find out why soon enough, I'm going to call that point the fox point. You'll see why in a second. Further on, as we go up the list here, we've got all these hominids running around and they start about 10 million years ago. And by the way, they don't start in Africa. They start in Siberia. Then we find them in Bulgaria. Then we find them in Greece. And then we start to find them in Africa about 4 million years ago. But remember, in Greece and Bulgaria, it was 7.2 and 7.4 million years, in Siberia, 10 million years. So don't tell me hominids started in Africa, because they did not. We know that now, but your kids wouldn't know that because you're not going to be told that. But up here, just up here, just before we get this fine look at Homo sapien, mind you, the Homo sapien is the first one to carry a weapon. That's a really a warning sign there, ladies and gentlemen. The rest don't have one. Around about here, I'm going to call that the Labrador point. Why? Because that's when all the hominids are around, and then one hominid again, mum and dad, decide to make kids, and those kids become Denisovan, they become Neanderthal, they become Homo sapien, and they become Homo Heidelberg genesis, and one more other. That's the next level. That's the story of what happened. We had two seminal points, one from monkey to hominid, and then two a higher order of hominids of which Homo sapiens prevailed over the others. That is the story you've been told. It's a lie. At the very simplest level, 
If that is true, then we've broken a cardinal rule that nature obeys for every other species on the planet. And we need to look at that next. So can we please, mate, something nice and cute now, since we're doing a science lesson. I don't want to lose the audience too well. A couple of cute pi pictures, whenever you're doing something boring, chuck that up and it wakes people up a bit. We've got a fox there. How do we know it's a fox? Because all foxes look the same. There might be a difference in the colour of the coat. The nose will be the same, the eyes will be the same, and so will that. I'm looking at this, and I'm comparing it to us. That is, for me, that fox is where a new series of hominids come out that lead on to the second break, which is the Labrador. Now, the Labrador has evolved from, a, from the fox, and he's one species again. But here's the point, ladies and gentlemen. We can mix and breed their Labradors, but as they stand, I know what Ab Labradors look like because they all look the same, roughly. All cheetahs look the same, roughly. All lions, tigers, in fact, every animal on the planet that has gone through that, that particular setup there will look the same, except humans. There are seven billion of them, and no two are the same. That is the only species that's gone in a completely different path to all others. Now, we're told that all of us come from a shared mother and father. But look around. I don't see any similarities here. Humans can grow from three feet to nine feet. They can be 40 kilos and they can be 400 kilos and they still function. No other animal does that. All other animals have roughly the same physique. We don't. They have roughly the same face. We don't. We have nothing in common with any other species on the planet, but they try and tell us that we're part of the nature's plan. Well, what plan is nature making here? It doesn't make sense. Moving on, please, Evan. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, Evan's not going to read that now because it's too hard to read. Yes, it is. But basically, it's an announcement by the top archaeologist in the country three years ago. Out of Africa's wrong. We don't know what's going on. Now, that's the official news. All students in Australia should know about this. They've been taught a story that's wrong. Chris Stringer is basically the top archaeologist in the, in the world, and he said, no, nah, we got it wrong. The date is wrong. Now, the date is wrong according to him by about what, Evan? About 400? Yeah, about 400. He's wrong. We now know that Homo sapiens, sorry, Neanderthals and Denisovans were walking in the plains of Europe 750,000 years ago. We know that's true. That means that Homo sapiens haven't split. The split has already taken place before 750,000 years. So we now know Homo sapiens are at least 750,000 years old, and they didn't come from Africa, because Stringer said, I don't know where they come from, because we don't know anymore. So the whole story of what's taking place in the world has been changed over the last 10 years. But it's just kept within the group up the top. They don't share it around. Keep going, please, Evan. I must make a point, Evan. You've had two chances. I've had to ask you to move twice. Evan is supposed to do this telepathically, and um, he's off to a poor start today. I do score him every day. He's sitting on eight at the moment. Twice I've had to ask him to move. Now, you've got to start thinking when I want to move, mate. Don't forget, Leah's turn. Yeah, but Leah's come up later. She might scrub up better than you. I think she does. We already know that. So come on, get your act together. Back to work. OK, next up, here's the problem. Stringer admitted this in a different paper. This mob, the Denisovans, we've only just found them. They're in Siberia and they're in Spain, and they go from about 16,000 years to half a million. Don't forget, we've been living with them all this time. And if you walk down the street and walk past a Denisovan, what would you do? Nod. You wouldn't think they're only different to us, because they're not, because you're looking at one now. And that is the problem, ladies and gentlemen. My genetics is 4.8% Denisovan. I am 1 20th, not Homo sapien. And here's the trick. There's only one race in the world that has a high percentage of Denisovan, from three to six. I'm third in the world. Original people. Now, the Denisovans are found in Siberia and Spain, but they never came to Australia. So here's the question. Where does my Denisovan come from? Because the story you were told was 60, 50,000 years ago, the Africans got here and they stayed here and no one came until about 1600. Well, the Denisovans, we've worked out when the Denisovan kick in to original genes took place. 44,000 years ago. We're supposed to be stuck in here and the Denisovans are supposed to be stuck up there. 
this was not a long distance relationship. I think some Denisovans and original people were getting up close and very personal. Otherwise, why would I have 4.7 here today? Somewhere back there, my mum and dad, my great mum and dad back there have been hanging around with some other mob, that mob. And we don't know why they're there because the original people aren't supposed to have moved. So that doesn't fit in either. What I'm going to show you today is the top science in the world is coming out and the same commonality. It doesn't fit. That's a little bit better, isn't it? You're back to eight and a quarter. <laughs> now, here's another pack of lies. Whenever you have an argument with someone, they keep repeating the same thing time after time. What do you know? They're lying. So why do we call ourselves homo sapien sapien twice? There's the skull list up, ladies and gentlemen, three. Denisovans, Neanderthal, a modern human. Which one's the dopey one? <laughs> up here. Up here. Get used to it because it doesn't get any better. All of those skulls are bigger than ours. We're the back of the pack, ladies and gentlemen. Denisovans are around about 1450, Neanderthal about 1400, we're 1300. But don't worry, we've got 1700 over here. That's just a warm up to the main event. My point is, whenever you've seen stories about Neanderthals walking around, they look primitive and they've got hair all over their face. It's not right. No, not the, they're grunting and stuff like that. The only person who got close was Doctor Who. When he saw it, I thought the poets. The Neanderthals will get up, but the cranky apes did instead, which is us. Um, they've also discovered that Neanderthals had um, piped hot water in their villages. Yep. And we found Denisovan jewellery 70,000 years old that the women would be proud to wear today. And what were the Homo sapiens doing while Neanderthals were living hot water systems and the Denisovans were making jewels? You know what we were doing? Nothing. We were just hanging around watching them. We were not the top of the pack, ladies and gentlemen. The science and the genes keep saying the same thing. Oh, that was better. <laughs> OK. And here's the interesting part, and you're going to see where this comes from. They've discovered another set of genes that are only found in original people again. Because we have the genes of everything inside us. We have Neanderthal, Denisovan, and genes no one else has. Do you know what's interesting? Africans do not have Denisovan or Neanderthal. Original people have all of them, but Africans are supposed to be older but they don't have any Denisovan or Neanderthal, and their story is it came out of Africa. It doesn't make sense. Now, we don't know what that DNA is. We're not sure what it is, but it cannot be linked into any other species on this planet. And there's always a rule. If you can't look to an original society, we've got a saying called, as on top, so below. We've looked below, we can't find them. Do you know where we look next? As on top. Next one, please, mate. All right. This is a famous study that was done about three years ago that never got into any paper in Australia, which is fascinating because seven universities were involved. They were low-level universities like Harvard, places like that. David Reich is the head professor for Harvard in genetics. And what they did was they did a mitochondrial study of two tribes in the middle of the Amazon, the Tupu and the Gi speaking people. Why them? They were the only people in America that kept to themselves. They only married each other. The scientists said, if these guys have kept their genes pure, never had any other group in, we can study them and find out where the Americans came from. Good thinking? It makes sense. Six universities did this for three years. And David Wright said this. He said, we kept trying to make the result go away, but when we did and came back, it got stronger. The closest relations for mitochondrial DNA, which is what the women carry, which is very easy to measure and very predictable. Thank you, ladies. The closest measurements were Australia, Papua New Guinea, and the Andaman Islands. They're original people anyway. So what did we get from that? Next, to, next door? No, they weren't close. Anywhere in America wasn't close. It was Australia, Papua New Guinea, which was one country until 8,000 years ago, and the Andaman Islands. So we're getting a link. So who are the first original people in America? I can tell you now, they, they are original. Waldenese, how many skulls has he got? 55. 55 original skulls. Waldenese is collected in Brazil and Argentina. Sylvia Gonzalez talks about in Baja, California, doesn't it? Yeah. Pennine woman, 25,000 years old, original. We all know that. There have been many, many articles about the original people being American and Australian at the same time. None of them ever hit the Australian press. There's a reason for that. 
oh, that's right, there was an article in Cosmos, and wrote about this, and guess what happened to her? She got sacked. She got sacked. We rang up and said, we'd like to follow that up. Said, oh, we're not working with Jackie Hayes anymore. We got rid of her. I knew she went too far because she said the Americans were original. It was put in a magazine once, but that's what happens when you step outside the boundaries. I just threw that to an archaeologist in the room here. OK, moving along. She picked it up too. OK, let's stop talking about women because there's enough men here. We've got to do our side of the story. We've got what's called Y chromosomes, gentlemen. You know what they're good for? Nothing. You can't date them, you can't do a thing. But what you can do is you can compare them to each other. There's nothing else we can do with them. So if you're going to do a study for Y chromosomes, don't expect to spend much time on it because it's pretty damn boring. But these guys, two Russians, did a study, and it's the largest in the world ever. It's called the walkthrough. And what they did was they took 400 samples in particular and compared it to 13 distinct Y chromosomes that only Africans have. They're called haplotypes. And they just they compared them. They figured, OK, we've got 13 times 400. That's 5,200 possible hits. The closer the number of hits, the closer Africa is to the first people. You know how many hits they got? None. Not one. Those 400 samples did not show any African um, connection whatsoever. And these guys then did a map. And here is the map. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the African story, and it runs up there, and that is the marker for Africa. Over there we have Europe and Asia, and they start about 60,000 years ago. And notice you have one, two, three people. Those three races are still in Africa. That's the rest of the world, and that's not the central point. That is there. There's only four races, but these guys weren't brave. That's African, that's European and Asian, but they wouldn't stipulate who the other group was. Well, there's only one group left. It's my mob, the original people. We're the beginning point there. So what have we found so far? Adam and Eve. Adam is not African. And Eve can't be. Could be Bulgarian, could be Siberian, but not African. That's just not part of the deal. Next one, mate. Right. Let's just assume for one second we could do, and I'm not going to do any more mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosomes, we could do this for another half an hour. But then half of you would be asleep by then, and I would be too. So let's do something different. And when I spoke to the Sydney Morning Herald, because they did cover some of our articles, I spoke to them about Toba. And I pointed out something to them. She wrote back and said, we can't put that up. It would destroy everything. It's just a fact, that's all. This is the story. Mount Toba, this is what we're told. This is what your kids are told. Around 75,000 years ago, it got very full up in Africa. A group came out of Africa. They went through the whole of the Middle East, didn't stop. Didn't, go, didn't stop in Asia or Europe because they're not around yet. Went through the whole of the Middle East, the whole of Asia, came down to part of Indonesia or India, got on a boat and said, look over there, there's nothing. Got 20 other people to get on the boat with that person, they sailed to Australia and stayed there. That's what they tell you. They said they came out 75,000 years ago. That is what's in all their books. It's a lie. Because of that. Ladies and gentlemen, you may have heard of Mount St. Helens. That scores one. Mount Toba scores 2,800. Uh, Vesuvius. Oh, he gets all three. That's pretty big. And Krakatoa, you've probably heard of that one. That got 18. Now, think about that. Krakatoa's got 18. That one there, which is Tom Bower, which is the biggest we've ever witnessed, is 80. That's 2,800. When that exploded 75,000 years ago, according to the archaeologists, not me, there were only 5,000 people left in the world. And they were found in the top of Sweden and the Scandinavian countries and South Africa. And the rest of the world was decimated. I can tell you, Vesuvius, they've got 10 centimetres of ash around there. With that eruption, they found one metre of ash in Greenland and three metres of ash in India. Do you know what it was? It was like years and years of winter. And the world was wiped out. There were only 5,000 people left in the whole world. But that is exactly the same time when the Africans came out of Africa and walked through the whole of Middle East and Asia. Think about it. There was no one there. They were all dead. Why didn't they stop? They hunted gatherers. They could have found some food in Asia somewhere. But no, they went through the whole place, got to a Indonesia, stood on a boat and said, let's go that way and we can't see where we're going. That is what your children have been taught in schools today. 
Ladies and gentlemen, it is time to bring in our famous American philosopher, whose name is Evan? Uh, Judge Judy. Judge Judy. <laughs> Judge Judy has something to say about this. Judge Judy made this comment. If it doesn't, if it doesn't make sense, it's a lie. Well, your children have been lied to because it's not true. These are facts, not opinions. Now, let's just assume for one minute that I've got an idea what's coming up next and I'm going to preempt something without looking. Let's just assume that all of that is incorrect. Turn it on next step and see if I'm right. Oh, shit, I got it right. Okay, for a person who never has a script, that's not bad. There is no script. There is no script, that's right. Thank you. All right, here's the trick, ladies and gentlemen. Africa, they got here 60,000 years ago. See all those dates? Every one of them contradicts that. Even Lake Mungo, which is a skeleton, it's a modern skeleton found 62,000 years ago, it's in the middle of Australia. The story is they got to the top as fishermen, made their way around the coast first, and it took about 20,000 years to get down to the southern part, then went up the rivers. That's the story. Any one of those that's right, we have proved that the out-of-Africa theory is incorrect. But I'm not going to talk about those ones, all ten of them. I only need one to be right. I'm going to talk about the ones that the academics have accepted. Because every one of those other ones is someone's protested against it. This one that was there a minute ago and disappeared and came back. This one they've given up on. In fact, the guy that did this is the main proponent of the out-of-Africa theory in Australia. He's the guy that's the strongest devotee to out of Africa. And he's now said, I'm wrong. I've got it wrong. What they found down at Moijul Point Ritchie, which is near Warrnambool, we now have an accepted date of human occupation of 120,000 years. Throw 20,000 years on top if they came from the top to come around. It means they got to Australia 150,000 years ago. And there's not one academic in the world has ever said that. They've never said that because they reckon 150,000 years ago Homo sapiens were just evolving in Africa. Now we've got a date here of 150,000 years in Australia and Jim Bowler, who has fought against Alan Thorne, didn't he, with his date in Lake Mungo and said it's too big, bring it down to 45 because that fits in with out of Africa. He said at the finish, he said, yeah, I had 90,000 years and I didn't push it there, but now I've got 120 I am. He said, I know there are cynics around who think I'm wrong, because he was one of them. He said, but wait until the other dates come out. They're going to be larger. So what we're now finding, ladies and gentlemen, is if you look at the archaeology through dates, it's not right. Australia did not start from Africa. I know where they came from, and we'll get to that soon enough. If you look at the gene genealogy, if you look at Y chromosomes, you look at mitochondrial DNA, there is nothing that links Australia with Africa. You can do studies of their blood, and I've seen them, where everything that the original people have is the opposite of the Africans. We have nothing in common with them, and we have no dreaming story that ever acknowledges the African people. I know of a dreaming story, and you've heard it too, where we told the Africans not to come here, and that's the dreaming story. It's called the frog. It's a toad, isn't it? A frog. Yeah, frog. Got turned into a frog, yeah, because he lied to the Africans when they came here. And he got turned into a frog. And that call reminds us, we don't want the Africans here. That's what the frog sings, doesn't it? Yeah. So honestly, guys, we've got a story about Africa, not here. But unfortunately, the scientists aren't keeping up with their own science. OK, moving along, because we are going to nearly get there. I think we are. That's right. All right. OK, who was here 120,000 years ago? We know. We've met them. We've been working with them quite some time. Put him up. OK, this is how this starts. We got a phone call about a year and a half ago from a group of people saying, we found a skull. And they sent the skull to me. And what my first reaction when I saw that was, oh, God, it's a bound skull. Here we go. I know how this is going to turn out. They're going to say they took the kids when they were young, they wrapped around the top there, and they made their, their, their skull stick up this way. There's only one problem with that, and I'm going to show you now, and I'll hold this up. We'll look at it in more detail later. When you have a bound skull, it peaks. This bound skull here, that's the wrong one, flares at the back. It, it's supposed to go up to a peak because you're binding it. It shouldn't get thicker at the back. When you look at the back of this skull here, the back of it is the widest part. When you look at a homo sapien, 
the widest part of a Homo sapien, which I have here, is around the middle. It's around the middle. So already we've got a major difference with this goal compared to others. So what then happened was we were in a situation where I knew straight away this was going to be an issue. And I'll confide in you why, because I already knew the farmer that had found this had found it two years ago. And what should a farmer do when you find skulls you've never found before? Who should you contact? The government, of course, because they're the people who look after us. We vote for them every three years and we get the same rubbish every time, but that's what we do. So therefore, he went to the government. And the government dutifully sent out two archaeologists who looked at the site. I thought they took it back to analyse it. No, they didn't. They just looked at it on the day like this and had a look at it and turned to the farm and said, nothing to see here. That's just a normal hypersapien. Don't worry about it. Off we go. End of story. Next day, some people came around and told the farmer, no one ever comes back to this site and looks at it again. He was told that in very clear terms. So when I got a phone call, I made sure that I never spoke to the people arranging this because I got, how many threats to be put in jail? Oh, at least half a dozen. Yeah. And they couldn't put me in jail. Believe me, they were trying. But I never spoke to anyone. And they kept saying, I ran the... I, I didn't. I turned up there on the night, 2 o'clock in the morning, never met them before. Met the eldest one hour before I went on site. I did that deliberately. I then told the government time after time, this was not my venture. I turned up and assumed it was all ticked off. You mean it wasn't? How would I know? I didn't talk to anyone. I talked to another guy who told me everything. That's why yeah, I'm talking to you today and I'm not in jail. I'm doing a Skype from jail because I played that game with them. So off we go. After lots of negotiation, we go and look at the skull and the first thing I found is where is the skull I saw because that's what I got. Well, I'm saying straight away, where's my brain? It's gone. Where's the conical thing at the top? It's not there anymore. Ladies and gentlemen, what happened was the guy stood on top of the, um, above it and took a photograph down and you got a really distorted perspective of what's there. You'll see it properly now. As we go through this, I'll point out different points with each one of these and hopefully I'll try and remember what I wrote down here. I know I'm going to start with this. Those things. They're called eyes, but not like that. I've measured them. I've measured uh, those eyes and worked out the distance there, the, the um, size of that compared to our eyes. Those eyes are 46% bigger than yours. They're not. They're not used for daytime running. This person had a permanent head sunglasses. You would go blind in the day. It's too bright. So that's the first thing I picked up there. Now, if you have a little bit closer look at the second one there, you'll notice also front two teeth. I checked it. They were pulled out. Did you know that was still the ceremony at that place when Cook came? How's that for continu continuity of a religion? Front two teeth pulled out then. We think this is at least 60,000 years old. We know that as a fact. I won't go into reasons why. Much older than that. That was still going on today. But I can tell you something else. Going on today, nobody had a face like that. Nobody. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that model was made up with 50 photos from this particular site when the, site, the face is intact. So when people challenge us and say, how do you know? I know because I was there. I saw it. And this is what you're looking at now. Next one, please, mate. Now... Where is the skull at the back? You didn't see it in the first two, did you? It's there, but it don't go up. It goes back. I still have an argument with the reconstructed skull. I think the, the forehead on this one, the one we've got now, is too high. I've got the original, and I don't reckon it's that high. I reckon it's lower, but I'll take this anyway because I'm not going to argue with the experts, and it still works regardless. But that goes back 17 centimetres this way. Yours goes back 15 and look how it flares out at the back. That is not a skull like yours or mine. And the genetic, genetic derivatives that made it go that way, the stuff that this person was told, the genes that are telling the skull to go that way, we don't have anywhere. Whatever's going on there is something the hominids don't do. OK, so there we are. We've got that. And of course, there's another thing that, that put me off a bit with this one here. It's that. The nose starting up here. I couldn't work that out. And then I thought to myself, well, hang on, this place was dug up. When the farmer dug it up, he hit a blade that went through the two skulls. And I figured what he's done is he's pushed the nose up because it's starting up here. And I do know, if you look at your forehead, you've got a depression in the middle, haven't you? Not this one. No depression here. This particular being here, 
that's the peak at the top. It goes out the furthest there, we depress in, it points out. And I think that's drawn the nose up, but we weren't sure at the time. We're still playing around with that one. Okay, next one please, Evan. Right. Do you know what the most amazing part about this skull is? It's not the head. It's the humerus bone. It's this bone that goes from there to there. Everyone in this room, I can measure your humerus bones between 28 and 32. That's where you are. If you're about 6 foot 10, 6 foot 11, you're more towards 32. And what do you do with someone that measures 45? Now how do you measure their height? Because I did that, and I found out the femur was 42, which is exactly the same height as me, which is 5 foot 10. But the humerus went down to 43, but there was no elbow bone there. It was broken. I went down to 43, which is down to here, and there was no joint. So it's got to go to 45, which means that arm is going to end up just around the ankle. It'll be nearly dragging on the ground. And the arm was only one inch thick at its widest point. So what's nature doing here? It's making a being. Gibbons have 35. This has got 45 or more. It's made a being that's got the longest arms on the planet, but they're thin as anything. They won't work properly. It's made a being that's got eyes that are so damn big you can't go out in the day because you go blind. What's nature doing here? And my point is, nature's not doing this. This is something different. There's different, there's different reasons for this, this being to come the way it has turned out. And it's a lot different to ours. Next one, please, mate. Oh, then there's that indentation on the first skull. We don't know why that's there. I can tell you this. If it had been any other person had their head smashed in like that, they'd be dead. But it's on one of the four skulls we've got, that marking there. And that person lived. We don't know what happened to him, but whatever it was, it was major. And it was hundreds of thousands of years ago and he was still alive after the point. Don't know what that one means. We're still working on that because that site's been turned off now. No one in Australia is allowed to go there. It's cleared out. You can't touch it. Next one. Right. Then the second one because it was buried with another being. And this being is nothing like the other one. That is the first burial site in the world, ladies and gentlemen, where you'll get two different species buried together. Think about that. That's like finding a place where you find a Neanderthal, a Homo sapien, a Denisovan buried together. Never happened. But it has here. What can I tell you about the second one? It's this one here. Well, number one. Can we do the next picture of him, mate? Guess what's at the back of him? He don't have a suture. There are no sutures on this being. I want you to think about it for a sec. Particularly, I'd like the ladies to think about this for a sec. There's no suture on this head. It will not bend. It will not squeeze in. It stays like that. I don't want to think about having this being as a child because I don't think it's a good idea. Okay for the guys, but not for the ladies. No suture. Number two, more importantly than that, my first skull was six to seven centimetres um, mil thick. The skull of this one here, if we can please, Evan. Oh. What is the tooth doing there? Man, you've left me in a corner here now. I look like an idiot, don't I? Fair dinkum. Ah, uh, look. All right, well, forget what I just said. What's also interesting about this being, <laughs> after having giving birth to it, now what if we have a dental problem? Let's have a look at that. Well, here's the trick. If you have a dental... Oh, dear. He'd actually made his way up to about eight and three quarters. Ah, yes, yes, that was it. We had that. Oh, he's back, okay. Well, no, he's back down to eight and a half after that. Disastrous effort there. I want you to think about this, ladies and gentlemen. We, we had one tooth, and we were going to date it, but we won't go down that path. Have a look at the roots and think to yourself, what if it's decaying and you go to the dentist and you ask him to pull it out? Isn't that going to hurt? Because all our roots are straight. This isn't. They're curved. They're curved teeth. So, here's the question. What does this being have in common with us? Breathes air and probably eats. That's it. Next one, please, mate. Right. Then we found another group. And here it is again. We found a, a, a group in a university contacted us and said, we've got a professor who's been showing us skulls just like this. We went and met this guy and he gave us all the skulls. That's what we have there. That's what we have there. What you've got there is a remake of the two of them we've got. And this is the bits of them there. This one has got the eight there, and you can see the same thing again. No forehead up there. 
you've got that piece there, runs across like that, and there were eight pieces in all on that particular one. Next one, please, Evan. Okay, there it is holding again, and that to me is roughly the right angle it should be at. I think he's given it a little bit too much on the, um, the forehead, but we'll get away with that. Next one, please, mate. Now, I want to go back to something. You've seen the two words up there, three words up there, son of by army. <laughs> I need to explain something about this, and this is where we start to... So far, we've been doing full science. Now we're going to start to do the mystical. It goes together. When I was driving towards this place, one of my elders rung me up, Wirichin, and he rung me up and he told me, you're going to see a skull, aren't you? Which was fascinating because I hadn't told him anything. And I said, well, yeah, Wirichin, but you're not coming. He didn't even know about it, so I know about it. He said, this skull you're going to see, do you know where it comes from? And of course I didn't. He said, well, I'm going to tell you now when you ask him, he's going to tell you it comes from the Wirichin area, which is in Victoria. I said, well, Wirichin, I said, you really put yourself in a corner now, mate, because I'm going to ask him, and if he says it's not Wirichin, it's not the Wimmer area, you're going to look so bad. He said, don't worry about that. He said, that's not what I rang you about. He said, the second thing I wanted to tell you was this. He said, the skulls you're working with, the one you found and the other ones, he said, you'll find more, which I didn't believe we did, but we have. He said, they're the sons of Biami. Now, I don't know if you know who Biami is, but for original people, Biami is the first, the creator. This would be like saying that that's Jesus Christ and his brothers and sisters. I said, well, I said, gee, okay, thanks for that. Hung up the phone, went to the place, walked to the door, came in, we went into there, and the first thing this guy said, before I said a word, the very first thing he said was, oh, this skull, skull comes from the, uh, from the Wimmer area. I said, okay, well, then it is the son of Biami. Why do I know that? Because he got the first part right and he shouldn't have known any of it. We get that a lot. Okay, next one, please, mate. Right, there it is in reconstruction mode, which we brought today. Now, the reason I bring the reconstructed piece in, this is what it was done, how it was done to begin with. This took about four months, a lot of work from two people, okay? And there is it at one stage there, and you can see inside there, there's a residue there that comes off the original skull. The reason I bring this with me is because it means this, this skull has a contact with the conversation we're having with the people in this room that still has a resonance of that particular being. And with the second skull, which is coming up in a sec, we have the ochre. On something I should have mentioned about the skull we'd seen before that I didn't, and Evan didn't remind me. Yeah, my fault. I didn't tell you something about this, the, the first place we went to. There was a square knob on the back of one and a half centimetres by one and a half by one and a half. That's Neanderthal. Neanderthal always have a square knob on the back. They're the only group that have that. So what we found at the first site was Neanderthal. Neanderthal aren't supposed to be in Australia. Now we get to this other one. Keep going. This one here, which I just picked up. Put the skull on this. I want to show you something, ladies and gentlemen. This is you, Homo sapien. Watch this. That skull fits inside this skull easily. Have a look how wide the skull is at the back here. It's got to come out this side too. That's incredibly wide. Now, I'll tell you why that's very important you understand that. I thought it was a Denisovan. I've been told by the experts working on this, this is an archaic Homo sapien. They've only ever been found in Africa. It's now been found in Australia. Now, what's really interesting about that is this archaic Homo sapien, which is supposed to be our ancestor, has a brain capacity of 1600 cc. You and I today, we are 1300. This is 1600. Now here's the point. This is our ancestor. This is us. This is 16, this is 13. We've been dumbed down and it's shown. All these other beings have got bigger heads than us. You've seen it, we're not making it up. And this thing here is an archaic Homo sapien. It's bigger than this thing here. It's about the same size as the one we're dealing with now. So the question now becomes ridiculous. I've got a, an archaic Homo sapien that's never been found in Australia. There it is. We've got a Neanderthal. A Neanderthal that's never been found in Australia. It's buried at the other site there, but the government won't let anyone onto the place. And now we've found this thing here, and we've got 28 pieces. And the interesting part of the story, ladies and gentlemen, is this one was buried near the other one again. It is 15 mils thick. 
It is the thickest being that's been found in Australia ever for the skull. And it's buried alongside. Look at the size of the back of this skull here. Look how thick that is. That is huge. We're about six and it's 15. You hit that in the head with your hand and you know what's going to happen? Cast. You won't be hurting this person. You punch him in the head and nothing good's going to come out of it for you. This is a massive skull. It is so thick and so different. The upward slope on this one, the one we've got here, from the ridge to the top, it's six and a half centimetres in height. This one here, one and a half centimetres from the eyebrow ridge to the top of there. It is five times, four times higher in forehead than the other one. They're nothing in common with each other, so why are they buried near one another? What is going on in Australia where we're burying different types of species in the same tribal ground? Now, what's interesting is with that one there, the skull was coated in red ochre. All the bones were coated in red ochre and some were left uncoated. And the interesting part was the inside of the skull was coated in red ochre, which means the brain had rotted away and all the skin had rotted away and they take it back out and paint it again. Is there another burial uh, complex or procedure like that in Australia? Never. Never been heard of. So what is going on at these sites? It really is an amazing story. Next one, please, Evan. Ah, and now we're getting closer. We're getting closer to the real event. Now we're starting to build this together. This was taken, that's probably about two months ago, I think. And what's very interesting, ladies and gentlemen, is a new part of the equation that's coming up soon, I hope, with a comparison. There's the picture taken from the side. And you are starting to see how much that slope, that skull runs backwards, behind my eyes and down here somewhere. It's going to have a completely different neck. Now, there it is with the big eyes. Um, I think the forehead's a little bit high, but we'll, put out, we'll get over that anyway. Keep going, please, Evan, because I think we can. Ah, there we are. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, a couple more here. I've put alongside. This is the one we've got. That's the one there. That is a triangle. That's a sphere. That nose starts there. See where it starts there? This one starts right up there. Okay, so we still had one problem. Uh, that's the Homo sapien there. And notice this is a much wider face than the other one. Look how thick that bone is there compared to that one there. That face has nothing to do with that face. If this being was sitting in this room today, I'll tell you what 99% of the people would say straight away. It's an alien. And you know what the other 1% would say? Nothing, because they're vision impaired. <laughs> That's the only way they wouldn't say it's an alien. And I've said to other people, what's it look like? Everyone's the same thing. Oh, it looks like an alien. Well, here's the trick. It is. It is an alien. And that's what we're getting to next. There's the look at the two skulls. I put one next to the other. Which one is longer? That one is. Which one's wider? That one is. That goes to 11. That goes to 16. There's such a difference in the size of these heads. This being's got 1,700 cc. That we've, we've got 400 less. We're not even in the ballpark. And then we get to the interesting part, I think, Evan, don't we? Right. Third skull. At the moment, we were bait, about to go on to it, but an academic. Michael Westerway has stopped us from going on there. They stopped us. We are all ready to go. We had professors. We had a university ready to go. An academic stopped in and won't give a reason. Will not let us go any further. That's an interesting story, but we won't do more with that. But it just goes to show you we've still got a lot of people to fight. Next one, please, Evan. Uh, this is an important one. This was found in Victoria. And this time we found out something for sure. Because if you do the next picture, there's the nose intact. It was up here. And this one fell from a cliff and broke there, but the nasal passage on the other side is still intact. Which means these beings, their noses start up here. They don't start like ours, round about in the middle there, they start above there. So that now means these guys have nothing to do with the face that we've got. It's all new. Okay, moving on please, Evan. That's it. All right. How am I going for time, please? So I know. What have I got to go to? Three. Oh, brilliant. This is going to work out well. I race through that a bit. Now we can relax a bit because um, now we get to the interesting part now. Okay. I put you through an hour of science. Now we can start to talk about what this all means. First up, oh, first up, <laughs> first up, um, you need to understand something about this skull that um, 
is an evolving story, and I'll hold this one because it's mainly this bit of skull here, this the skull cap here that I'm dealing with. When we got this skull, it stayed in um, Sydney for four weeks because I wasn't going to take skulls up through Jetstar. They do know me in Ballina, don't they? Yeah, they uh Car planes I can get straight through, but not in Sydney, man. They wouldn't let me go through with that. I wouldn't get it through. So I had to come down and drive and bring it back home. Now, I'm not going to big note yourself, myself, but I need to explain this to explain what happens after this. When I got home, I still play tournament tennis. Never been sick a day in my life, ever. I'm the only person I know that's never had a headache, had a cold, and that's true, isn't it? Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous, yes, but it's never happened. But don't worry about it. I'm going to make up for it a sec. From the time this skull came home, I started to get really sick, like um, basically all bar dead. In fact, I think twice my wife thought I was going to die, and I know Evan thought the same thing, and everyone did. I couldn't play tennis, and for six months, basically for two months, I couldn't get out of bed. Um, I had pleurisy, pneumonia. I basically had everything that could wrong. In fact, I had a, the best Chinese herbalist acupuncturist in the region, didn't he? He said, it's like a wildfire went through and burnt every organ in your body by your heart and your lungs, and also my brain. No, lungs went too. Okay. Oh, the lungs went bad. I had pleurisy and pneumonia together. All of this took place, and the whole time, I just figured, what's going on here? Because I was fine before that, and I knew there was something that was wrong, and I knew it was that skull. So I called in some psychics. I called in elders, and they all gave me exactly the same story. And this is very important I share this story with you because it relates to today and relates to what Lee is going to talk about in a sec. Okay, it works like this. I've been told this, and I'm not going to say it's right or wrong. I've got this from all the people who have healed me, and I was healed, and I was told how to do it. And the story is this, that this particular being, the one we have here, well, I'm going to tell you who it is. I might as well get that part done now before we go any further. Sorry about taking that away from you, Lee. I thought it's still something of yours. Every tribe in Australia shares only one dreaming story. I've been to all over Australia. I don't care if it's Gangamo and WA. It's in South Australia, Queensland. Every tribal group will tell you the dreaming story of the seven sisters from the Pleiades. All my elders, without exception, the ones who know the old way, will always tell me and tell me that the Pleiadians are our brothers and our sisters. Right? That's just given. Now, I don't care whether the white fellas in Australia don't believe that. That's our story. That's our history. And it's the only story, dreaming story, that every tribe keeps. All other dreaming stories are region-specific, but this one is national-specific because it's about all of us. So we know that is true. So now what we have is we have a situation where this, this being came. Now, when did the Pleiadians first come here? According to the elders, they were called here a long, long time ago around a million years ago. And they were not called by us. They weren't called by the reptilians. Mind you, they're still around today. Don't worry about that. They were called by the trees. The trees made a call. You've got to understand something, ladies and gentlemen. If you would find out, you'll find out trees, life is common. Trees are rare. That is so much more intricate than any other planet. Trees are such a rare thing. They called the Pleiadians, and they called them because they were in distress. This is what was taking place. The reptilians were in control, and the whole planet was being polluted. Trees were being cut down. Warfare was everywhere. It sounds like a horrible story, doesn't it? You wouldn't think that would ever happen again. And the trees were being cut down. There was pollution everywhere, and they called the Pleiadians to right the planet and put the balance back. So they came. And when they uncloaked, they were shot down. Because reptilians are very good at one thing. That's destroying things. That's what their skill is. They're still doing it today. So, that was shot down. But one, one of these beings, this one here, survived. And was taken in confidence by some beings, probably reptilians. In fact, I know they are. And they re de developed a trust and rapport. That was going well. And then one of those beings betrayed this one to the reptilians, they killed this being and then taken by the original people and they were buried somewhere special and kept away. Now I was told by the elders and by the psychics the person who betrayed that being was me. And why I was being sick is because when it first saw me, it recognised me from before and then just put, what one person said was they put a poison inside me that was like no other poison on this planet. 
Now, the elders told me, I'm not going to die, but I'm nearly going to die. And if you know anything about Indigenous people, our strongest ceremony is called the death ceremony. And sometimes we don't get through it, we die. No big deal. These things happen. Happens to all of us. I was going through a death ceremony being put through by that particular being. Now, the long and the short of it is, that being, at the end of it, we're fine now. We're mates. I now give it ceremony. I put it in a special place. I did the things I was doing wrong I don't do anymore. And that particular being now has been found, along with the other four, for a very good reason. To complete the task that took place from before. Now, at the end of this talk, I'm going to explain what the task is. But I don't want to give that away because people will probably leave at lunchtime and won't come back. So I've got to keep you here with something. What I am going to do right now is now that I've given you an introduction to this particular being that stays at our house, and by the way, the New South Wales government, who are now our friends, aren't they, Evan? New our new friends, are okay with us keeping their skulls there, and they, they're not taking it off us, because we're getting on pretty well. With the academics, nothing. Okay, but what I want to do now is now that I've started to introduce you to this particular being, I want to introduce you to someone else whose name is Leah. Now, I've been doing this for quite some time. I've heard a lot of people talk about UFO stuff, and I don't doubt it for a second. I know it's true. Our people know it's true. But of all the talks I've heard, I always found hers the best simply because she, she didn't try and convince me about the beings that are there. She told me about them. I got to learn about them. And that's something I don't hear too often because I know they're there, and I suppose everyone in this room thinks the same way as I do. What Leah did was she is in contact with them, and I am absolutely convinced, for a lot of reasons I'm not going to talk about now, it is genuine. And she made contact with them about these beings because I wanted to find out more. And to go any further with that, I'm going to pass this over to Leah now and she's going to spend the next 15 minutes taking you through and introducing you to these beings, who they are, and remember, they've come back for a reason. So I'd like you to introduce you to Leah now and you can have the microphone for this. So it's a it's a long time now, and um, I have met through physical encounters as well as astral and telepathic a bunch of different types of beings out there. Um, some of them have transparent skin, some of them have blood red skin as well, some of them are more mammalian, while others are uh, arachnid. If you've ever seen an arachnid before with, you know, torso, four arms and four legs and eight eyes looking at you saying, hi, how's it going? Yeah, that's uh, it's my life. And um, I have had um, a lot of friendships with these particular beings as well. Um, some of them I trust more than you know, I, any other person here on earth. And um, I ha we've gone through a lot together. And um, they've taught me a lot about their worlds and they've taught me a lot about their culture as well and a little bit about over here because um, I only know what's happening on the surface, but um, because they've been here for longer, I get to learn a little bit more about what's happened before humans. So, um, <clears throat> humans aren't the only types of beings that have been living on this world. So, okay. Okay. <laughs> Where was I? Yeah. So, humans aren't the only type of intelligent, intelligent being that have actually walked on the surface of this, of this planet. Oh my God, oh wow, <laughs> my voice. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a little bit hoarse, I'm a bit sick at the moment. But anyway, um, ETs have been here for not only 100 years, 1,000 years, 100,000, they've been here for millions of years. And um, they have been interacting with some of the more uh, earlier forms of life on this world as well, uh, through genetic and um, mental um, inter interfacing. Now, I have um, learned a little bit about, because through my travels, by the way, I've actually never encountered these sort of beings before. I've never seen them. I've, um, so they were all very, very new to me until I was actually introduced um, these skulls to me. I was like, oh wow, I didn't know these types of beings existed. But then I made contact with a particular a uh, friend of mine named Mesreth, and um, he actually gave me some information about them, and I in related to uh, Stephen and Evan, and uh, they thought it was pretty interesting. This particular uh, 
contact of mine, Mesreth, he's been around for about a thousand years, um, give or take a couple of centuries. I think he looks fantastic for his age, but anyway. Um, he, he's a um, uh, Nevensaurus, this is the name of his race, and um, they have evolved to the point they are no longer uh, physical, although sense, they're not physical the way we understand physical to be. Um, they are energy, uh, however they can still interact very much so like we can, but they can also interact with other types of uh, uh, energy and matter in other frequencies and other planes as well, but that's a whole other thing. Anyway, so when I asked him about these particular uh, skulls, he says, ah, yes. <laughs> and um, he gave me a little bit of information. They actually grew up together. This is, I, I'm, I'm really paraphrasing the sort of uh, um, conversation we had, but when I actually asked him, he says, yes, uh, we grew up together on the same world. They were, whereas his people, they walked around on land, on the plains, and during the day, these particular beings were awake at night and they usually kept to themselves in the high mountains and on the high cliffs. Of course, they interacted with each other, but um, they all, they both kind of evolved a little bit differently. So when it was an Evansaurus's turn to uh, go out into the stars and you know, make contact with other life forms and beings, these other people did as well. And they had, their own reasons to go to different places, but um, one day they stopped traveling. They stopped going through the stars, and I, I asked why. What, what's what's the why did they stop one day? And Mezra said, "It's not really um, super important, but um, they just had enough." And the feeling I got was like they just. They got, they got fed up with something. And I'm not saying that, oh, you know, they came to us and they were like, oh, my God, this place sucks. We're going to go back home. No, no. I, something happened at some point. Maybe they just got tired. Maybe they just wanted to return to something a little bit more um, primal, which, which is totally fine. And uh, that's exactly what they did. Um, however, Mesoth likes to um, uh, keep an eye on them, and they keep an eye on him. They, they make contact with each other every once in a while just so you know, don't forget us. I asked them about their names. Uh, what was their species names? Because, you know, I know about uh, Mezus' people and um, other ETs as well. And um, he says, their names aren't important, but uh, what you need to know is we came from the, um, one of the planets that is orbiting one of the stars in the Pleiades, in the Pla Pleiades, Pleiades star system. So, they are Pleiadians, and so are we, technically speaking. And um, I said, wow, okay. So it, there's also other beings in that particular um, corner of, of um, space too, but I thought it was really interesting. There's a lot of ETs coming from that um, place, so I think it's, um, and there's a lot of people who say that they also have their past lives as well as their physical forms in this day and age to be coming from that um, part. So I think this world, as well as over there, we have a very, very, very strong bond and a very ancient bond too. This isn't a new thing. It's never been a new thing. This is, I would almost even say this is a cycle. Now, I'll, do, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up as quickly as possible, but um, my feelings of this world is, I guess you could say a little bit more pessimistic and it has been becoming more pessimistic as the years have gone by. And um, I've always like, oh, what's the bloody point? Like, you know, this place sucks. Like, why, why, what, I'm talking to Mezzo like this, why, why do you even bother? And um, he says, there's a lot of reasons why we're here. And um, he's always kind of been my rock to, he kind of brings me back down to earth, if you pardon it. And uh, he says that, look, you guys have something special. And, I mean, every form of life has something special about them. But there's something in you that we see that we want to, we want to nurture, we want to take care of. And we knew you from an older time, and you were great then. You're still great now, but we want to help you back into that, what you were before. And that's why we're here. And I feel that he's not only taught me about other ET people and other races and shown me different, different worlds and different planes, but he's also taught me about humans as well, 
which I think is the most um, important uh, thing to be reminded of as a millennial. So, and that's my experience. <laughs> Thank you. I'll take you there step by step, but to begin with, to do this properly, I'm going to take you on to this by first of all listening to what my elders did when we were there, because I want to tell you about what took place to the site before we talk about the science. Then I'm going to get Evan to read from the gentleman who worked on this site for quite some time to give you a feel for what it's like. Now what took place with this particular site, which is called the Standing Stone site, there were originally 184 standing stones. Some of those stones are as tall as they are at Stonehenge, but Stonehenge by comparison is rubbish. It seriously is nothing. It doesn't stand in the shadow of this particular place. This is far more important. Yes, it does have that similarity. That particular arrangement of stones, we have the map. We actually have the scaled map of that, unlike Stonehenge where they put the rocks back where they thought they were. In this case, we not only have the map, we have the name of each of those rocks and we know their meaning. We also have the songs for the site that were given to us by the elders before that elder passed on. We have the song for the stone arrangement, the song for the mound and the song for the hand signs. We can put this, this site back together completely as it was. Not like Stonehenge as it used to be because we never lost the ceremony. They did. We didn't. We have that ceremony. I know the elders holding it right now. So this site is different to anywhere else because this site's not dying and it's going to come back. Now what is really interesting with this particular site is as I'm going to start, we're going to leave it at that picture because I've got to tell you, my elders told me that every site I, went to, I go to, if somebody can't point upstairs and point to a constellation or star, it is not a sacred site. Walk away. That's our rule. Now I want to tell you what actually happened when we got to this site. We pulled in about 20 volunteers from all over the country, didn't we, Evan? All over, to be part of this. I got permission from the gentleman who destroyed the site. I sat when he was 91, he gave me permission to, for two days on site to do full archaeology. It had never been done. And I sat with him a half a dozen times and every time he spoke about destroying the site, he broke down and cried. He hated it. And he wanted this done to save his soul. And it's interesting, two weeks after it was on the front page of the local paper there, he passed on, 92. He was waiting for this. So... What actually happened was, when we got there, we had about 20 volunteers and about 10 elders. Yeah. And what happened was, as the elders said, OK, we got permission from the farmer. Does that mean we have permission to go onto the site? No, we don't. We don't have permission. But none of our volunteers knew about that until I told them that day when they got there. I turned around and said, OK, guys, we have permission from the farmer, but now we have to get permission from the spirits. If it is not given, we're going home. I can tell you there's a few people looked at me and they were a little less than happy with the news that they'd flown from West Australia to stand around to be told by someone, some nebulous entity didn't turn up and therefore you're going home. Anyway, so off we went. I went up there with the mob and um, we made our way up there and of course we called out, as you should when you go onto a sacred site, you call out to the old ones and tell them you're coming, we announced our way in. And then Carno, who is my elder, that gave me my first ceremony, he was the one who speaks first language. By the way, there is a first language the whole world speaks, and we've kept it. I have that language here now. It was spoken all over the world. And he went up onto the mound, and he started to sing, Old Way. And we didn't know what he was singing. It was first language. We knew that, but we couldn't speak it. I knew bits of it because I'd read it. And um, we, so I don't know who asked him. Someone said, Kana, what are you doing? He said, I'm calling the spirits. We have to get a sign. Now, after about a minute of singing, two hawks appeared different angles and started to circle above us in a circle. And I thought, jeez, it's not bad. I could sit here all day and sing and I wouldn't get any birds. I wouldn't even get a budgie. He's got two elks. Anyway, and we looked at him. And I was about to say something. He just went, I thought, oh, not enough. Then three more came. And we had five circling above us. And this time I said something, Carno, is that a sign? He said, no, it's not a sign. It's not complete. I'm thinking, OK. So he continues singing and then we have eight. Now the eight were circling. And then they broke up into, I swear to you, a figure eight. And because the mound itself is made of two circles and a piece, a pathway that joins them up, we now had the two circles. And he turned around to me and said, now you can get the others. He said, follow the hawk. I thought, well, what are you talking about? So and I did. I followed the hawk. You ever try to follow a hawk? You can't walk. You have to run. And I think that hawk, because I never looked up. I just saw the shadow in front of me all the time. He said, follow the shadow of the hawk. 
And it dawned on me after a while, I'm running flat out for about a kilometre and a half. I was buggered when I got there. I could tell you, I could barely breathe. And I'm keeping up with this hawk and I'm thinking, hawks can do about 150 k's and I'm doing 20 and it's staying with me. But it kept ahead. I got there and just when we got to the gate, it peeled off. And I told them, well, we can go and we can look at the site. So that's how it started. We got permission off the spirits. Now what I want to do is I want you now to listen to what uh, Frederick Slater, who was the president of the Australian Archaeological Society at the time and fighting massively with Professor Elkin for top dog, and we know how that turned out. But at the time, I want Evan to read to you what he told to his assistant working on site. He read, sent him a letter to tell him what this site was like. So you've heard it from the blackfellas about the fact that the hawks looked after the site. Now you need to hear it from the president of the Australian Archaeological Society about what this site is about. Big voice. Just place yourself in the position of Petrie or Carter, exploring an Egyptian tomb. Your work is of more importance for it relates to the existence of first men on earth, their history and their philosophy. They believed in an invisible God and the immortality of the soul. But within this temple you will find the seven elements, which are the basis of all knowledge, all science, all history, and all forms of writing which began in numeration. Right, Slater is saying this temple is the beginning of culture, of intelligence, of awareness, of knowledge, and he says, well, in this temple is the knowledge of everything. Now, that's got to be a fairly large claim to make, ladies and gentlemen. It's a fairly strong claim that he can make a claim like that, which, by the way, I must tell you about this site, is the only site in the whole of Australia where elders from Broome, from Cape York, and by the way, the places I'm nominating, I've read in the paper, Broome, Cape York, Fraser Island, Armand Land, they all came down to this site and did their ceremony on this place. They did their own dances there. Not dances from somewhere else, but there. You've got to think about that. You can't do dances from some other country, but there you can. What I'm trying to explain to all the original tribes is this belongs to all of the tribes. And we are sending someone out for 400 elders to sign this up. Every tribe in Australia knew about this place. It would take an elder 10 years in sabbatical to get there and come back. And when you get to the site, it's not two mounds. It's 10 acres of hundreds and hundreds of stone arrangements. Some have hundreds of rocks. And you've got to do all the ceremonies for each of those sites to get to the mound. They would send uh, the most promising um, male and female for each generation um, to come to that site. Yeah, they'd pick one to come. And that would be an honour. And they might spend half their life getting there, and some would die on the way. That would be an honour too. So this is not like a normal site. So what we'll tell you now, first of all, we're going to take you through the first half of the site, then we're going to put up what mainstream put up to try and dismiss this site, and we'll take you through the history next. But let's go through the site itself. I'll show you what it looks like. Now what you're going to find there are hundreds and hundreds of shaped rocks everywhere. Because Jack, when he destroyed the place, three rules bulldoze a lot into the ground, scrape and chuck them away, and the big rocks were stacked by the dairy, the large ones, the ones that are on the mound, and there were about 50 to 60 of those were stacked on the dairy. And believe it or not, we've got a full story about that and witnesses who saw it there. So we know it's there. Um, the interesting part, ladies and gentlemen, we're in a caldera here, and these rocks are sandstone. Shouldn't be there. Everybody knows that. Everyone said the same thing. In the notes we've got from Slater and the notes I've got from geologists, are saying, what is these rocks doing here? They shouldn't be here. This is igneous country and in the middle of it all you've got massive sandstone. See that sandstone there? That's coarse. We have coarse and fine sandstone which means we have different deposits. It's not just from one spot. Now the interesting part is we are talking about thousands of tons of rock that have been carried to this site. Some of these rocks weigh 10 ton. I want you to think about what you've been told of what the technology original people had. How do original people pick up and carry a 10 ton rock up to slice, up to 45 degree slope, isn't it? Then put it in the ground. How do you do that? And there is no one that could give you an answer. I know how they did it, but we'll get to that later. Okay, moving along please, Evan. Right, now notice this ladies and gentlemen. The first thing I notice is, notice the sharp edges here. Yeah, right, how do you do that? With rocks. If you do use rocks, you have what's called percussion points where you hit them. I checked. There is not one percussion point on any of these rocks. They've been cut. 
Now remember this, we've got accounts of this being found in 1840, 10 years after we got up to the far north coast in Byron Bay where I live. We've got accounts of blackfellas being on there and running away carrying rocks when the whites stumbled onto it. Whites didn't make this. There is no record of the whites making this. This is a blackfella creation or a Pleiadian creation. Okay, moving along, please, Evan, another shaped rock. Then you've got the second mound. Doesn't look very good, does it? It's 70 metres and it's 5 metres high and it's 3,500 cubic metres of fill that doesn't belong there. Every geologist said the same thing. What's it doing here? My question is, how do you pick up 3,500 cubic metres of fill and carry it there? Where's the transportation? There's sandstone in there, there's clay in there, and there are other types of rocks in there. And we checked around the edge there. In fact, Evan, you did a ditch there, didn't you? Yeah, I dug a hole. He dug a hole. Very nice hole, one and a half metres deep, well, and we didn't find any sandstone. It was very nice. It was one of the best things he did. It's a nice looking hole, and we've got pictures of it too. And the government rang us up about that hole, didn't they, Evan? Yeah, they did. Yeah, they, did. yeah, they were really good about it. That's a map of every sandstone rock we found there. You walk away from that mound and you won't find one of them. Now, that mound is 70 by 5 and it's more sacred than the other mound. In fact, it's so sacred, I just can't tell you a thing about the damn place. It's much more sacred than the other one. And it's a women's site. Of course it's more sacred because it's a women's site. But... Again, I can't talk about that. They're the shape rocks we get from that one there. You'll notice they're cut in different ways. Keep going, mate. More shape rocks again. What we do find is no shape rock is the same. They're all different. That's got about seven different angles. You can't see it all from there. They're not natural. Okay, and then we move a little bit further past the shape rocks, and I'm pretty sure we come to other bigger ones. We found them. See, what happened was, when I spoke to Jack, he would tell me about Dad sent him out. He lied about the date. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. He sent him out to, to bulldoze the whole thing. Why did he do that? I've got the letters of Slaters, and I know why. The government had been to his house. They were going to confiscate his land. I know this is true because we did some search on this too. So what happened was they came in the Second World War, 1940, and do you know what the government can do in the, during the war? They can do what they want. Jack told his son to go out the next day and bulldoze the site, which he did. He did it for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. He told me all the large rocks were stacked by the dairy, which they were, and they were there in 1955. We'll talk about that after we have a break. They were there. Now, you can see, if you look there very carefully, ladies and gentlemen, can you see where the, the, the dirt is? That's where it was buried. It was standing like that. Now, that might like, seem like a small one. That's column of basalt. That'll weigh about three tonnes. Some of the bigger ones there, and you can see them there, you can see all the scrapes by the bulldozers there when they unearthed it. And this was found, this was actually find, found right next to a quarry. Now, what Jack told me was this. These rocks here, they were stacked by the, the dairy. They put them there. Yeah, he agreed to that. And then what happened? Jeez, we're doing all right, mate. Way ahead of me. I can't believe you did that. I've even lost from up to you. Oh, that's right. What happened? See, you made me forget for once. Normally his job is to remember, remind me what I was saying because I forget, but this time it's his fault. What happened was, Evan, Jack said that we took the rocks up to the dairy. Now the farm is 50 metres from the dairy, right? And that night, one of the nights, they were there at the night, and we came back the next day, and the 80 rocks had all gone. All gone. They were taken away. There's only one problem with this. Jack's family were the only people who had earth moving equipment until 1988 in the whole area. Before that, they did all the earth moving equipment everywhere. And that's why the rocks were dumped near quarries, because they knew the quarries. Jack knew the only people who could pick the rocks up were the ones who moved it from the mound, which was them. What happened was they had a big investigation in 1945, 45, 55. They took photographs of the standing by the dairy. They recorded the whole thing. They took it off to off to everyone, a couple of days later, that's when they hit it. Because they thought, oh my God, it's back out again. Because they thought if we destroyed the site, it's okay. But the rocks were still there. They hadn't done a good enough job. Now, I'm not blaming them, because remember this, if they hadn't destroyed the site, the government would have taken their land. But I can tell you this, in 1939, that farm was owned by the CBC Bank in Sydney. In 1941, that farm was owned by Jack Bashford. Now, what happened in those two years? Oh, the war. That's when farmers make a lot, of money, a lot of money when the war's on. No, they don't. How come the land ended up in his hands? 
because he did what they told him to do. And that's the truth of it. And the rest of it, Jack was, Jack was 15. He did what his, son, his dad told him to do. And the interesting part of this story is, ladies and gentlemen, he told me this. He said, Dad told me to destroy the mound after they'd moved all the rocks. And Jack went back up and he told me, he said, I put the blade in there. He said, I just had this feeling if I cut it, I'd die. So he went back and told his father, and he said, no, no, dig it up, dig it up. And he told his dad, he said, Dad, you can't drive a tractor and I'm not doing it. So guess what? The mound stayed. But let me share you a story. When we went to the women's mound, we had three people, didn't we, Evan? They had, we we're going to put a trench right in the, the women's mound in the middle there. They picked up their blades and they all come back to me. And they all told me the same thing. They said, if we put our blade into that mound, we're going to die. I didn't read it at the time. I didn't know it till later. I had read it before. It's a women's site. Men aren't supposed to be standing on a bloody thing. I sent three guys to stand on top with shovels. We sent the elders up there and they said, no one's going near this place again. And then we read some more about it. And that's why we don't talk about it enough. Ladies and gentlemen, those were the original... St we know where those rocks are. We know where they are. We know where the mound is. We know where all of these bits and pieces are. By the way, that's actually, that site is for sale. It's public land, but there's one person in Australia that's banned from walking on there legally. Who is it, Evan? I'm legally banned from walking onto a site that's for sale. The public can drive in there. But if I'm there, I'll be arrested. I've been told that. They didn't like what I had to say about that. OK, next one, please, mate. Right. Here's the proof, ladies and gentlemen, as if you didn't need it. See that there? That's black, but what you see is red. That's a patina. That takes a long, long time standing out in the air and the elements for that to grow that big. Thousands of years, which is what this is. This was the mound, and that's, by the way, it has to be column of basalt that's on our rock mounds. That's the only rock that works for what we use it for. Next one, please, mate. And there's a second one where the dozers came back and destroyed it again, and the third one again, please, Evan. Yep, there it is again, and they've stacked it completely. And see that dirt there? That's all gone. All those rocks have been stolen and sent somewhere. But fortunately, we know what property they're on. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's about what time, Evan? It's almost time for me to read again. Oh, right. Oh, that's right. You are reading again. What are you doing here? We're doing that, remember? I think we've got 15. Yep. What's he doing? <coughs> no, the esoteric passages. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah, I wrote the script and I've forgotten what it was here. All right. Now, what we're going to do now, Evan is now going to close this up by racing off and getting a book, or have you got it? No, no. Okay, what he's going to do now is before we're going to stop, we're going to stop in a sec, I want Evan now to read to you what Slater said, this has got all knowledge, all wisdom that's ever been. It's time you hear what was actually translated and then we'll find out how we could actually translate the first language because he's a white fellow, it doesn't make sense. And when he did the Standing Stone site, he never went there. And he translated the whole thing but never went there. It's an interesting story. But for now, Evan is now going to read to you what Slater translated that was found on those mounds. Now, he's picked, I think, about seven sentences because each rock is a different story. So he's just taken the stories from different rocks and here's some of the ones you've got here now. I'd like you to have a listen to what is said and what was written on that first mound. God came in with light from darkness and gave man a soul and the sons of man brought in with the light became the pillars of heaven. Life comes in, life goes out in darkness. It's the light that holds it forever. Guided by truth, man came to earth through darkness, from the light of life that shines far off. The breath of God is the divine, the light of the soul. Okay, now they're taken from his notes. What you're going to notice there, if you read stories about the beginning of language, the books tell you language started with very basic things. Food, cave, hunting, animal, that's it. This is supposed to be the first language. It's sublime and it makes our language look like rubbish. So what we're starting is, what I'm starting to learn is, way back, we knew a lot more than we know now and way back we were far more advanced than we know now and here's the important part of this equation. I've made fun of the fact, and I'll get to this point, the last one, and we'll close with that. I made fun of the fact that we're the dumbest of all the group there. What I haven't told you is we have one skill that the Denisovans, the Neanderthals, and all the other hominids never had. 
where they have one skill that they never had. And that is why Leah read that bit about the fact that we have something within us that the whole cosmos is waiting for. And really what we're going to find out next, what Slater was dealing with, was that truth. Now, what you're going to find is, and this is very interesting, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to look at this view. That is the view if you stand in the middle of the standing stones and you look to the west. And you'll notice there are three pyramids there. And I remember the day Graham Hancock came up to the Standing Stone site when we had permission to take him up there. And he was with Santa. I said, Graham, I want you to go for a walk along the mound there, but I don't want you to look the other way. I don't want you to look west until you get to the dead set centre of this mound. And when he turned around to the dead set centre, that's what he saw. Three pyramids together. Now, I can tell you, according to Slater, do you know who came here to learn all their wisdom? The Egyptians. In fact, you're going to hear later on about an Egyptian boat that was found there. And we have the anchor. But they landed there. The Egyptians, look, honestly, you're going to find out when we come back, Egyptians in Australia in the 1930s was like bread and butter. Everybody knew the Egyptians were here. And after the Second World War, it was hidden. I can tell you the top academic in Australia, Sir Grafton Elliot Smith, wrote an article in 1906 saying the amount of Egyptian artefacts and um, evidence in Australia is phenomenal. That's all been covered up. But what we found there is when Graham got back there, he said, my God, that looks exactly like, and you know where, don't you? Of course, the three pyramids. And I said, yes, Graham, of course. Where do you think they got the idea from? There it is. There it is. So when I talk about this mound being something special, and I mean, yes, it does mark out suns and stuff like that, but it marks out the beginning of everything. It marks out the beginning of humanity. And what's more important is it marks out, if you listen to the narrative, man came to earth is repeated more than any other saying. With his seven senses fully developed. Hang on, we got five. Yeah, but the five we've got only supplement and help the two we've lost. And it's the two we lost, that is what we're supposed to get back. And that's what the Pleiadians are waiting for. And that's what Leah was talking about. That is what we've lost. And when we come back, we need to address the most important equation. Look, let's get used to this, guys. We're not the top of the class. When you look at those mob there, every skull you've seen is bigger than ours. That's not what we're here for. We're here to do magic. That's our skill. That's what we're supposed to bring into this equation. So when we come back, we're going to take you through, and I'm going to leave with one last comment now, because so far I've been telling you our version of the Standing Stone site. But there has been an official version of the Standing Stone site made, haven't there, Evan? Oh, yes. There has. And it's been done by a very reputable public publication called the Courier Mail. <laughs> Some people oh, laugh. I'm getting laughed at. This is a Murdoch paper, for God's sake. Don't you understand what that means? It's the Courier Mail we're talking about. And when they rung me up and said, I'm the writer, and his name is Condon, for the feature they do on a Sunday, he does a 5,000 word feature, he wasn't lying. And when he said he wants to do the Standing Stone site, he wasn't lying, was he? And of course, I didn't want to talk to him, but my elder had told me we had to go through mainstream. Didn't I, Richard? And you know that every day because I tell you all the time, and I hate it. I'd much happier to do a Nexus and New Dawn and just leave it at that. So I said, OK, come along. You can come along. And he did. And he promised me, he promised me he was going to do this properly. Sometimes you just don't believe journalists, do you? And the best part of this story is, oh, didn't we get slammed the first time, Evan? Oh, yeah. Oh, we got slammed the first time. But the best part of the story is this. The Courier Mail hasn't left us alone. They did us recently, and the best part of the story is I wasn't mentioned. It was all down to him. What did you destroy? <laughs> well, just so everybody knows, apparently I destroyed one of our national holidays. Mm. I am the destroyer. Australia Day. Yes, the Courier <laughs> Mail have dis declared he is a destroyer of Australia Day. And I can tell you more. Slater is a nobody. He's nobody at all. He's a wild dreamer. He um, basically had, he had a group, didn't he? Yeah. A small group. A small group. And there was no one important in there. Uh, he never had a paper written and nothing was published about him. That's what the Courier Mail said. So when we come back, we've got two versions now. We've got our version, and we'll try and justify our version. But remember, we have a highly esteemed publication that says that we're, he has destroyed Australia Day, which is good because it wasn't me. I didn't do that. I've destroyed a lot of other things, but I didn't screw up Australia Day. That's his problem. And we have insulted the original culture and everyone else by saying this rubbish. So when we come back, 
We've admitted that we've made a mistake and now we'll try and justify our cause. I know that you might, people might think, well, it is the Courier Mail. Yes, I shouldn't have done it, but we did. But the best part is I didn't get slammed the second time you did. So when we come back, ladies and gentlemen, I'll take you for a history tour through what actually happened at that site and you're going to find out that nobody ever questioned it. It is a holy site. It is the most important site in this country, if not the world. And within one year, we hope to have it back together. Uh, getting back to where we were before, I want to show you something that shows you how the media can play around with the truth and present part of it. I know that sounds unusual to be selective like that. But there's two pictures of Frederick Porter. Slater. Slater, sorry. One was put up by the Courier Mail. And by the way, that is Frederick Slater, a return vet from the First World War, 1918. Think about that for a sec. Uh, Slater's just been born, and there he is. See the second one there? That is actually Frederick Slater. Now remember, the article said that Slater was a dreamer and a crackpot. Which one of those two people would you pick to put in if you were going to pick someone who's a bit wild and a bit of a dreamer? You picked the guy that was fought in the First World War. Frederick Slater, the president of the Australian Archaeological Society, did not fight in the First World War. And that is not him. That's him there. Now the second guy up there, he looks a bit straight. He looks pretty conservative. He looks like a decent sort of person, he's sort of a person you wouldn't think was a radical or a hippie, a bit like me. He looks okay. So which one does the Courier Mail pick? Well, they didn't lie. They put up a picture of Frederick Slater, so they were correct. But there's some other parts of their story about Frederick Slater that aren't correct. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to say something about this guy. I want to tell you why it is he got so slammed. And it's not even the Standing Stone site that killed him. It was a site called Baragara, wasn't it? Yeah. He actually, and you're going to find out, I'll, I'll explain how he could actually understand these sites and read the original language when he's not original. The most important point with Baragara is he actually wrote a paper, which, by the way, was published, and we have it. The Courier Mail said there was no papers published. And it's been cancelled, of course, by Sydney Uni, Tropical Medicine. They cancelled the uh, archaeological paper, as you would, because there was no faculty of archaeology anywhere and anywhere. But what's interesting, ladies and gentlemen, is the paper that Slater wrote there spoke about by army coming here in a ship and landing at Mount Yengo. And then spoke of his wife, Mula Mula, who Slater said was not born of the earth, was born of the stars and came down here and then went back up. Then it spoke of the nameless one, one of by army's sons, who tired of the earth and felt something was not right about it, a philosopher and a clairvoyant, and he got in a ship that mingled with the clouds and when it took off there was fire underneath it. That's what Slater wrote in 1939. He's talking about aliens. Now who's talking about aliens in 1939? This is what killed him. This is why all information about Slater was going to disappear in the set. And that's why the Courier Mail said we look. They went to every university in Australia and couldn't find a thing about it. We had a person called Eric, didn't we, Eric, yeah. that went to every library in Australia and went to microfiche, which has never been doctored, and we found a lot of information about Slater. He was written everywhere. Anyway, let's take you through the process of what these two guys did. It was Slater, who was sitting in his desk in Sydney, and it was Fordham, who was the principal of the local primary school, Brunswick Heads Primary School, in 1939. And ladies and gentlemen, in 1939, the principal of primary school was right up on the top level of status. So he's a crazy liar too. Anyway, let's go through and see what happens here. Let's see how this builds up. Okay, the next one. First of all, you need to understand something. I said this before. Talk about Egyptians in Australia in the 1930s was boring. To be honest, I'm bored with it too, because it's so obvious. I haven't met an elder that hasn't told me the Egyptians came in. Not one. In fact, I know exactly how long they're here for, down to within a couple of years. They came here 4,600 years ago and left 400 years ago. I know why they left, and I know what happened. I was told by the elders. 400 years ago, they came to Sydney. If you go to Sydney, that takes you in, man. If you go to Gosford, you go up north. There's different places they were taken when they came here. When they came to Sydney, they went to the middle. They went to the Pitch and Jatjara mob and there they stole four of their rocks. They stole them. This was not the mob they worked with four and a half thousand years ago. This was a different mob now, 400 years ago. 
The warriors tracked them all back, all the way back to Balmoral, which is in Sydney somewhere, and on the beach there they speared all of them and told the boats never to come back, and they didn't. And there's only one group that were told to leave that didn't go. The British. Anyway, this is common. You're seeing there a form of mummification. There are 17 different forms of mummification in Australia. Some of the top experts, I think it was Sir Ralph De Salento. Salento. They said that the mummification that took place at Darnley Island was exactly the same as what took place in Egypt in the 21st to 23rd dynasty. In fact, they even used the same bone hook to take the brain out through the nose, and they rode a crocodile. Two, they rode, rode a, a boat two k's out to the ocean there, and was judged by a crocodile spirit. And then the Egyptians said, "That sounds like a great idea. We'll do that too." You're going to find time after time we're all saying the same thing. The Egyptians came here to learn magic. They knew how to make pyramids and stuff like that. They didn't come here for that reason. They came here. This was a, like a sabbatical, like a mecca, and spe special people would come. It wasn't known to most of them. Next one, please, mate. We'll go ahead now. Okay, this is the story about the fact that standing stones are fake and that Slayer is a rat bag and an idiot and just makes the whole thing up. What we're finding here is everyone just keep flicking through them, Evan. Just read that one if you want. No, I don't, because there's so many of them. It'll be about the mound, it'll be about Slayer. The remarkable column, uh, carvings of the Wollamai, that'll be about Slater, of course, religious mound discovered, <coughs> religious mound. By the way, the archaeologists told us today there's no religious mound there, it's not even an archaeological site. In the paper there, where blacks worship. Well, why are you worshipping the place that's not sacred? And the paper says it's a sacred mound, and it goes on, and there's stories about it there, stories in sculpture and painting, that's about Slater, how he had the first language. Um, and it just continues, oh by the way, and that is actually a paper written by Slater. Now here's the trick ladies and gentlemen, we still had a problem. I've got a map there of all the rocks and where they go. And Slater's written in there, that rock there, it wasn't there but it should be there and that's what it's called. But he's not there. How could he know this? This was for us the biggest problem we had. We had this guy saying he knows everything about first language, I know it exists, I know that. But where's the proof? And there it is, next to R. H. Goddard. That's the proof. Next one, please, Evan. It's Eliza. Yes, there she is. This lady is a hero. She's a legend. Her name is Eliza Hamilton Dunlop. She wrote Aboriginal Mother and Other Poem. She put Aboriginal songs to music. She translated Aboriginal stuff. She led the, the protest against the first verdict of Bile Creek when they were all uh, released. She fought against that all the way through, and she won the trust of the tribal chief of the Wollamai. Her husband was a magistrate, and he treated the black fellas well. She was better. She loved them. She spent years with them. And finally, they said, the elder said, first language is going to die. We're going to lose it. I will give you the dictionary. So she sat down for years and wrote down every word. Now, I've got a copy of it. Unfortunately, there were 28,000 words in this language, ladies and gentlemen. Well, not five or six, but I know how the language works. There are ten sacred words which I can't say aloud. Those ten sacred words, which mean earth, fire, wind, the spirit, <coughs> all sacred words, those words can have 30 suffixes and prefixes, and then you take parts of that word and you make other words. So every word in that first language is based on one of the first ten words. That's a really complex piece of work. Far more complex than any language we have today. You do realise the original language is still the most difficult language to pronounce and learn. Not like first language. That's just an imperative. First language is far more. And remember, I was told by the elders, first language is contextual and it depends on the time of the year what it means. You've really got to know your stuff when you're talking this. This woman's brilliant. And here's the trick. She had kids. And her son had a boy, and his name was R. H. Goddard. That's how he got the notes, because R. H. Goddard had the notes. His picture is stuck up all the way around in Sydney Uni. But Goddard's a smart man. He knew if he took those notes, what she said, he would get smashed. So what does he do? Two people wrote that paper, Goddard and Slater. We've read many reports where Goddard and Slater were out in the country together. But who got the notes? Goddard looked at it and said, I've got a posting in Sydney Uni. If I read this out, I get no posting. You take it, Fred. You're the adventurous one, and he did. 
He did. And of course, as we know, you will not find any record of him in any museum, any university. And if you read his letters, he will tell you, don't trust the universities, particularly Sydney Uni. Don't trust the government. Don't trust the museums. You know what? Still applies today. Nothing's changed. He was fighting the same people we are. Our biggest fight is with the academics. But I think nothing's changed. This is the same old story. Okay, moving along, please. The next one. Right. Oh, here's the other rat bag. Fred Fordham, the principal. There he is there now. Another wild looking lad. Dreads. Hair, yeah, probably got a dope or something back there the kids don't know about. He's the other one. Now remember this, he spent every spare moment he had for two years on that site. What is he, an idiot or something? Why would he do that? And he told, his notes are very clear. He knows what's there. He's brilliant. He's aware of what's going on and he believes Slater's got it right. And this guy, they're telling us he's lying. Here's the point. These people have to be lying for them to have a point there. Have they met the people? Have they interviewed them? Have they spoken to the family? No. No, they haven't. They just said he has to be lying. That's it. It doesn't matter what he said. He has to be lying because I don't like what I hear. That's what it comes down to. And Fordham was a very studious man. He was a principal early in life and did very well in the Department of Education. You know what? In all his records, never read anything about him lying, but I have read it in papers here, but not from the Department of Education. You don't get to be a principal if you're a liar and an idiot. At that stage, you've got to be an upstanding member of society. And he was. Next one, mate. Right. And here's the claim up. We stumbled on this recently. Belinda Rich found it in the Historical Society. We've got people working in the Historical Society going through every letter there is, ever, for mention of Slater and the Mound. And we found it. And this was taken in 1959 and it was an expedition that took place on the 8th and the 10th and 11 people were involved and they all verified they saw the standing stone rocks down by the dairy. Now the experts will tell you they're not there. Well what did these people do this for? Why did they do this? And it goes on to explain the stones. You can see the first one, it's a bit written over, in the shape of an alligator head, carefully carved out eyes, and a sunken eyes and a carefully carved out something. Another one's in the shape of a fish head. Next one, stone in carved is in undefinable. And what they were doing was photographing, and they photographed it in colour. We know that, we read it up there. First time it'd been done. Colour picture didn't come out well, we found that out too. Why are they doing this? Why are all these people? This is the only historical society up our way. And the person we ran is called Louise Daly. And there we are, we've got group two, front row, back row. Group one, group two. Front row, back row. And notice back row. This line is stones, significance undefinable, which means they didn't know what it meant. Now, how many stones are there? They're there. But you know what? Today, I still have the top archaeologists in the country saying, they're not there. They were never there. Well, why are they lying? They don't know Slater. This is 1955. He was gone in 1939. This is 16 15, years after. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry? About 15, 16 years. Yeah, yeah, keep going. Next paper, mate. We'll just keep going through. Okay, and then uh, there's more writing there. They talk about the Egyptian sinks, uh, ships and the anchor, which we're going to talk about some more, because that was there. There was an Egyptian boat found there. Everybody knows it's there. And we know it, we know where the anchor's still up. It's written in there. Keep going, please, Evan. And I'm going to... Oh, yeah, there's one there, and Evan's going to read... Ah, you want to that one. Okay. All right, now, what you saw was a report. It was done over two days by 11 people. And then what happened was they sent it off to who? Fred Fordham. Why? Because the other guy's dead. He's dead. Okay? They sent it to Fred. Now, this is Fred's reply. This is very important because he is the only man that was actually there when the, the thing was there, when the stands were standing. So, therefore, I take a lot of notes of what he's got to say, and I think Evan's going to read a couple of fairly lengthy quotes, but we should go to the original person who was there and hear what he's got to say. Now, first, he's going to convince you that he can do this when he's not there, because that's a tricky one. Go, Evan. Mr. Slater could not understand the dry surroundings. He assured me that when the other used it as a debris ground, it was surrounded by water. 
I noticed drains in the vicinity and correctly decided that they had been responsible for the dry conditions. So I learned from some old hands that in their youth, the water surrounding them was waist deep. Despite criticism, I firmly believe that this place was the centre of perhaps the highest degree of Aboriginal culture that existed in the central eastern parts of Australia. That belief is not wholly due to slavery. A full blood fit from Fraser Island, not only at the southern end of the Barrier Reef, told Bashwood that his father and other old men of his tribe used to come down to his you. ground. But they would not exactly say where it was. Old Dick said that he Sorry, and his fellows yeah. of similar age and degree had been searching unsuccessfully for it for years. Beyond that, he would not comment. Another old full blood would not discuss it. To any questions concerning it, he would reply, the old man would kill me if I talked to you about it. Nothing we could offer him would alter his attitude. So there's the original take on this. Now notice first up, Slater told um, Fordham there should be water there. I've been there. There's no water there. And the farmer said there's no water there. Nobody knew there was water there but Slater, but he wasn't there. Do you know why he knew that? He had the map in front of him. So when he put the rocks in, he knew where they went because he had the map. That was compiled when Elizabeth, Goddard, Elizabeth um, Dunlop was with the elder because he'd been up there for four or five years, six years doing ceremony. So he told him what the place was like. So he's standing there saying, he's got the map in front of him, all the translations. He just gets it out. Fordham sends it to him. He looks at it and says, okay, that means that, that means that, that means that, and sends it back. It's very simple. He doesn't need to be there because he has the manual. Honestly, anyone in this room could do it. If you've got the manual that tells you everything that's going on, Evan, wasn't there a, a time where he turned up at a site that no one could read? Yeah, uh, people have been trying to read it for over 20 years, and he just walked in there and in 20 minutes... Read the whole site. ...read it all and then just walked off. And then walked off, and they all stood there and said, we took 25 years, but he's right, he read it all. It's easy when you've got the manual in front of him, which is what he's got. You don't have to be a, a professor. You don't have to be the head of an archaeological society. All you've got to do is read and say, oh, that means that. And that's what he was doing. And that shows us. And there we've got there where Slater has basically proved to us, A, yeah, he knows what's going on. We didn't. We found out after. In another letter, he sort of covered it up a bit there. In another letter we read earlier, he said, I didn't even think of it. There he says, oh, yeah, I sort of noticed the drains. In the first letter he said, I didn't know. I went and found the drains. And then he said, and at the end I think he said, a tick to um, Slater, another tick for Slater, because he's a teacher, so he gave him a tick. So, ladies and gentlemen, he had the information in front of him. He didn't need to go there. He needed an assistant that could capably record everything there. And that's what's taking place. Next one, please, mate. Okay. Right, now what I'm going to take you through now, you can see I've been through this myself. Here's a series of letters. A guy called Captain Fletcher wants to come and see the Standing Stone site in about 68. What is really interesting is the memory lapse of Louise Daly. She was the same person in 55 that arranged to come onto the site. Right, and really important what she says here. She said, oh, I took pictures of the site from the site there also, and they're not very clear, as it's in colour, and we couldn't, make, we couldn't make out much about the footsteps, the footstone, but the important one is this. She said, Mr Slater was the owner of the property. He's not. Mr Bashford is. He should, she should know that. She went and got permission off Bashford. And further on, she says there, uh, Mr Slater brought some of the stones and placed them by his barn. The stones weigh tons and tons. She's losing her memory. Because at the start, she says it was a long time ago on one of these. And, she, and the other list, she said, a long time ago. It was too long. But what I find interesting is, yeah, the stones were there. But what she now thinks is that Slater owns the site. The paper told me that after he died, no one knew about him. He was gone. Nothing was said about him again. Here I've got a lady that was there that's got a memory mixed up, and now it's not Bashford that owns it. He owns everything. He brought the rocks up for us. He'd never been there. But she has got in her mind now, she's so convinced he's right, he owns the site. That's what that letter showed me. Not that she's got a problem with the memory, because as we get on a bit, that happens to all of us. I'm finding now doing shopping lists is nearly impossible. Even when the list is there, I still can't get it right. So I don't blame her for having a problem, because I have it constantly. But my point is, now Slater becomes the owner of this site. How can that be 
if he's never been there, unless in the minds of everyone there, Slater had it right. And that's what it tells me. Now we go to the critique. Thank you. This was the critique by Marion, Marinon that we all heard about, and I'd read it. And that was the one where we started to find out that these people are dodgy. And I read the letter, and it's a fascinating letter in fiction on top of fiction. And let me explain how it works. It starts there by saying he's got no theory. No theory whatsoever. But then he goes to tell me, well, yeah, I've got no theory, and you can't read this properly, but I can because I've read it a few times. But it starts in the first one and said that... Um, Maybe Forden's chartings did look like circles in 1939, but he could have been swayed by enthusiasm. Mm. But in the next sentence, it's not enthusiasm. It got worse. In the next sentence, in these grounds, possible unbridled enthusiasm within two sentences has gone from enthusiasm, which is okay. But unbridled enthusiasm means that you'll start to make things up. Now, how does he know that Slater is a liar? Sorry, Fordham. How does he know Fordham's a liar? He doesn't. Fordham's dead. This is written in 68. Fordham passed on about 66. He hasn't met his family. He hasn't met anyone else. Didn't read his record, but he said, I think this is what probably happened. How would he know that? He doesn't know that at all. Let's go to the next page. And it goes further. In the next page, he gets stuck into Slater. Ah, yes, we've got Mr Slater there. He's a bit of a worry. Um, he said, uh, it could be the fertile imagination of a mind. Okay, so we've got a fertile imagination with Mr Slater. But it gets further. It gets much worse. Further on, we find out there the word crackpot. We're gone. He's a crackpot. And it's said by two people there. It says there, inspectors, Professors Elkin and McCarthy. McCarthy's not a professor, by the way. Uh, said that the area is not genuine. And in Elkin's own words, Slater was considered a crackpot. Well, well, now we know the problem. He's a crackpot. Let me tell you a bit more about that sentence. Number one, I sat down with Jack one day, and out of the blue, he started talking about McCarthy. And I thought, what are you doing this, man? I didn't bring it up. And he got angry about McCarthy, and he told me what happened with McCarthy. He came. He came to the door, and his father and him told him never to come to the, uh, came to the g gate. Get off our property. Don't come near it. And he was kicked off. Now, Jack brought that up out of the blue. I wasn't even talking about it. I, I hadn't mentioned McCarthy. He brought that up and he was really angry about it. He said, that person, we don't think much of him at all. He wrote a paper and said, it's rubbish. I don't think much of him at all either. Now, with Slater and Elkin, that's different because Elkin is the first professor of anthropology at Sydney Uni. And that's the first time there's been a posting that deals with original people. Guess what year he was posted? 1939. You read Slater's letters, and who does he hate the most? Sydney Uni. Where was Elkin appointed? Sydney Uni. Now, here's the situation. Elkin is considered the number one person, the number one white fellow in Aboriginal stuff. Or is it Slater? Because Slater's story is completely different to Elkin's. Slater's talking about Pleiadians coming here and all sorts of other stuff. Elkin's not doing that. We've got two different stories. And here's what I learned as a teacher, and he's a teacher too. When there's a playground fight, you don't take the version of one kid when they're fighting. You listen to both and we'll work out what's going on. This guy's a teacher, and I've written in the article I'm about to put up. He's gone and taken the word of Elkin, who said he's a crackpot, but has never met Slater. In fact, he says up there, I spent 12 months looking for records on Slater and could find nothing. Well, if you can find nothing, how can you make a judgment on him? Do you know what else is interesting? He said, I could find nothing about the organisation, nothing about Slater, and nothing about this token organisation of 12 archaeologists. And he said, apparently, they're unqualified. Well, hang on. If you can't find any information on the association, how can they be apparently unqualified? Oh, I know. I reckon Slater, uh, Elkin said, they're unqualified. So what we've got is we've got a fight between the two top archaeologists in Australia, Slater and Elkin. Elkin says he's a crackpot. And this guy says, well, that's good enough for me. But here's the interesting part, ladies and gentlemen. After he wrote that, here's the clangor. What he then said, legend dies hard. The old times of the era, although not alive during tribal days, have heard stories. Perhaps there is some more truth in them. So this is his problem. All of the people around are saying, there's stories, it's an interesting place, there's something there. 
He's there in 1968. The stones are gone. There's nothing left. And he's saying, oh, I don't think there's anything there. Of course there's nothing there. It's been taken. But why don't you listen to stories that were going on everywhere? And the next page is even more interesting. I find this the most interesting one. It's the sum up. And I don't know if it's there or not. Where's the paper itself? Um, what it does, it must be on the last page, I'm not sure. Oh, there's this one about uh, Professor Isabel McBride came there. And what she said was this. I can't see anything. But then she goes on, she did admit that the legends are too many to ignore. So she said that too. Now, you know what I've heard? Everyone's, the account we've got is, McBride said it's rubbish. There's nothing there. She didn't say that. She said she couldn't see anything, but there were so many legends there. She then said, we could go back to Sydney Uni and do something about it, but there's a problem there because I've already got a file for it. And guess what the file is called? Fordham's Folly. Ah, why didn't she go back? Because she knew. She knew damn well that if she went back there, you know what would happen? She'd get hammered. She's the first female archaeologist in Australia. Do you want to go and fight all those guys and take this on? Because she said, I'll go back and do something about it. And it said in the finish, nothing happened, nothing was fulfilled, it never took place. What's interesting in the end, and I haven't got the paper, it's not that one, it's the other one, but I'll paraphrase it. He sums it up and says, so, what is it? And he says it could be legend, then he talks about three other things, or it could be the truth. And I feel he started with the right thing and ended with the right thing. The other three other things in the middle were, could have told a lie, could have made it up. No, they didn't make it up. And that is where all of the arguments against Slater come from, from that document. And that document is a fabrication. The teacher involved didn't even realise when two kiddies are fighting in the playground, listen to both sides of the story, then decide who's right or wrong. He just listened to one side of the story and decided, OK, his, Elkin says he's a crackpot. He is. Therefore, it's all rubbish. But then he says, at the same time, I'm going to keep looking. Why? He says, because of the legends. Everyone's telling him it's legit. It's interesting. You should take oral myth as not a myth, but as a truth. OK, we'll leave that in. Right. Oh, that one. Right. Now, what we're going to do now is we've got to the end of Standing Stones, haven't we? Evan's going to now close with the last comment that Slater, uh, sorry, Fordham made about that site to leave it with you. And then I'm going to tell you what's happening to it now. Slater described this ground as a ritual book of this very high degree. In it were told the stories of the first men of Earth, their history and their philosophy. He claimed the men who used this ground prior to the coming of the whites believed in an invisible God and the immortality of the soul. They set up no graven images within this temple are still to be found seven elements which are the basis of all knowledge, all science, all history and all forms of writing, which began in the new nation. These could be carved on rock as they are on At Brunswick heads they could be expressed by the placing of groups of stones or they could be carved on a small stone. We're going to get to the model line next. We're going down there next because that's where we're going next. We're going to follow this trail all the way through. But ladies and gentlemen, I need to explain where we're up to with the Standing Stone site. Well, the biggest problem we've got, you just heard one of the comments, some of the elders there won't talk about the site because they're still locked into the old way of thinking, which is, I can't talk about it, I'll be killed. The problem is the Standing Stone site no longer can be kept a secret because it's being, we thought that the subdivision was called off, but it's back on. They've put together five blocks one of them is an eco-village that already has a sustainable housing. And they've been joined up Slater's, uh, Bashford, Slater's, I'm doing what she did, Bashford's block onto it. And they want to build 465 houses on those four blocks, which is around about 85 houses per block. Now on the block, the land of Bashford's, well, I know that land, it's nearly all swamp. But there are two mounds there, wonderful building sites. And ladies and gentlemen, the larger mound is not protected. It's not registered site. It's a lovely building spot. You get a nice view over there of the valley, but it is not protected. So I've got a fight at the moment with the elders. The elders say we've got to keep it a secret. I said, you keep this a secret because it's not protected. Now what's happened was it got knocked back by the Byron Shire Council, not by the council who backed it, but by the people within the council who said, oh, mate, this is a shocking subdivision. You can't approve it. 
but now they're going to send it to the state government. Now, the state government in New South Wales, I don't know if you know this or not, are very pro-development. And this is a subdivision that's going to make millions and millions of dollars. Once it goes over $2 million, the state government can override the council. But the council want it. It's just the council workers who said this is a crap subdivision. And you know what's not considered in this? The Standing Stone site. So this is what we're going to do. We're trying to, we're going to send a group of elders around Australia from the 20th of June this year, hopefully, if we can fund it, and they're going to get the signatures of 400 elders. And those 400 elders are going to say that site belongs to every Aboriginal person in Australia. We want the site back. Well, they're going to come back here. We're going to put that into ads. We're going to get the elders to do um, TV ads. We're going to put in national TV. We're going to put it in the Sydney Morning Hall in the age. And we're going to make a funding thing. We're going to have a day up there. We're calling people together. And we're going to get the three, $4 million to buy the land back. And we're going to own it. Not the government. Not a lands council. Don't trust them either. A group of original and non-original people that will become the trustees to look after that place. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take the public on guided tours, and then we're going to do our private songs and ceremonies to bring the place back. Now, I'm going to get further to the story about why we need this site sung up right now, because we do need it sung up now because there's a change coming, and I'm leading towards that in our talk. But to get there, I've got to go to the ring from Atlantis, and to do that, I've got to go to um, down near the Wallamai now. I want to go down to where Eliza Dunlop was, and what was going on down there that the elders down there knew so much about what we were doing up there, well, down there, there's something going on too. And I'd reckon about a quarter of the people in this room have been to the carry-on glyphs. Would that be a fair call? Who's been there? Oh, it's more like half. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> right then. <laughs> right, well, it's good because we're not going to be doing the glyphs much. This works out pretty well, doesn't it? Thank God for that. Okay, first of all, I can tell you absolutely legit. And I actually do know how to prove it. And I'm going to see if I can get someone, not me, to do it. OK? And I'm working on that. I oh, don't worry, man. I'm working on that. Don't worry. There is a way to prove they're legit. All we have to prove is they're over 100 years old and all the arguments are gone. And that is really easy to do. And I know how it is, but we're going to do that a couple of days from now. But for now, yes, that is a legitimate site. But we're not really interested in the site. You see, when you want to look at a site, you've got to understand how blackfellas think. There's not one site. There's lines that run in all different dreaming track dimensions, and those lines join up. You've got to know about all of them. If you just know about one site, you've got nothing, man. You don't know the rest of it. Where did it come from? Where did it go? What we're going to do now with the carry-on site, we won't be doing carry-on much. We want to show you the area first. Now, first up, we're going to go back and do what we did before. I want to go on site. I always speak to the spirits because they're there. Now I want to show you how they respond when we speak to them. These photos have been taken by different people over about a five-year period, and there are about five different pictures, and we've got a lot more. We could give you 20 of them, of what happens when people go there in country doing ceremony properly. Yeah. Okay, that first one is between the mound. All these pictures were taken, and I can tell you, nobody had a spear in that, that thing when I was taken. I was there. I think that's Gavin, isn't it? Oh, is it? Okay. Uh, maybe, yeah, I, think so. I thought it was. No, I think it is. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now, what you've got there, of course, is the spear that's come out, and he didn't see one. It wasn't there in his face, but it was there. That's un That's nothing unusual, by the way. Those. Those. I've got to make one point. When you're between the, the glyphs, if you're a woman, don't stay there for a long period of time on your own. It's no good for you. Okay. Next one, please, mate. Men are useful. Yes, that's where men are useful. Always take a man into the glyphs if you can. It makes it much better for you. You shouldn't be there on your own. There is a picture of a rock that a gentleman showed me a bit earlier, and I said, I know that rock. And that's Richard laying on the rock, and that's quite interesting because what I'm saying is there are other sites there. That is a sacred place. We know those two rocks. We've known them from before. They lead in there. Now, what you need to understand in the old days, you wouldn't go straight to the glyphs. You would go to other places first and give ceremony on your way there. I go into Standing Stone site, 90% of the elders never got on the mound. They made their way through the different constructions and didn't get through that. Next one, please, mate. Right. Um, there's a lot of people here would know the grandmother tree. When I take people there, it's obligatory. If you don't put your hands on the grandmother tree, you don't come with me. You go back to the car. 
And I, I'm not going to upset the women spirits there. I can fight with the men's spirits, but I'm not upsetting the women's spirits. I'm not that stupid. I know the rules. You don't upset them. You go and see the grandmother tree. And this business about men's and women's business, you've got to understand, ladies and gentlemen, there are men's sites and women's sites, but they're damn so close than you think they are. And don't think the women didn't know what the men were doing when they came back and told them. It's not like that. Oh, well, just out of earshot. Just out of earshot. Uh, it's enough. It can be 200 metres away, and they could both be doing sermons at the same time. It's quite okay. Okay, next one, please, mate. And, of course, um, some of the ladies in this room will know about the healing table. Um, that is a very sacred sign. Um, and for those who don't, then we should prove it to you. Okay, next one, please, Evan. There's two pictures of someone on the healing table, a lady I know quite well, and you'll see that first picture was taken. You can just see a little tinge of colour turning up. That was taken about three seconds later. And there's a lot of people who've been on the healing table and a lot of the women have had amazing experiences. I don't ask anymore. They just come back laughing and smiling. I think, OK, that worked pretty well. We won't ask any more than that. That particular site, we've got a bit of a problem there. There have been some men on that site. And I can tell you now, that is one place a man should never, never, never go. Men know one thing. Original men know that women's magic is stronger than men's magic. You don't mess with it. It'll kill you. So some men have been on there, and the women are trying to clean it up. They've made a mess. You just don't have men on that site. There is a men's site there, for God's sake. It's somewhere different, but it's not there. That is not. That's another picture that came out of that. It was the very first one we got way back. A little serpent, wasn't it? About six years old. We didn't know what that meant at the time. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's to introduce you to the glyph from a different point of view, from the spirits that are there. Every time I go there, I speak to them, and I introduce the people I take there and explain who they're there and why they're coming. And people say to me, why do you call out? Why can't you just think it? I said, what, insult the spirits by not talking to them? Wouldn't work. They don't get it. OK, mate. Right, what we're going to do now is we're going to have to walk around the area. We're not going to go to the glyphs because we're trying to work out, is it Egyptian? Well, OK. This one here, we were taken there by the senior park ranger from there. He worked there and he took us to his site and he said it's at least 10,000 years old. At least, and it is because it took us all day, didn't it, Evan? Oh, yeah. Probably about 20 pictures and the sun came out for three seconds and we caught it. You can go there now, you probably won't find it. That is an unk. And inside there is an ibis footprint. <coughs> Who carries an unk? Foth. What does an ibis represent? Foth. What is that doing there 10,000 years ago in Australia? Because the Egyptians didn't have a word for Thoth then and they didn't have an unk, but it's here. It's here. Next one, please, mate. There's another picture. It's Duramullen. We know that's Duramullen because he's got a club foot. But us blackfellas, we don't do profile. We do two eyes, man. We don't do one. We, we're doing people. We have both the eyes shown. But the Egyptians, well, they're different. They do profile. And, of course, that's an ibis head there. Dura has got an ibis head and he's got the normal two legs because Dura has got a club foot and we know that's him. He's the son of Bayami. He's the son of Bayami. And there he is portrayed in the form of Thoth. I wonder where the Egyptians got that idea from. Next one, please, mate. Ah, is there any woman in this room that's been initiated? Good. If they are, you have to put your heads down and leave the room. We made the mistake once of showing this picture of Durumulan in proper headdress and they had to leave. They had to run out. We made sure of it. Okay, we'll show it now. There's Durumulan. And you can see him wearing the Egyptian headdress and he's in profile again. And the interesting part is we know this story. He's been killed in the underworld and been cut up. And in Galba, an emu form, who's a woman, saves him and brings him back and uses that shield to bring him back and puts him back together. And then there's a story of Isis and Osiris and it's exactly the same. So I wonder where they got that one from. Same thing repeats itself, ladies and gentlemen. We haven't got to the glyphs yet. Next one, please, Evan. This is an obvious one. It's the only one I've ever seen in my life where the arms are like this. That happens to be the Egyptian god of inheritance. Why would they be placing the god of inheritance glyph just there? Because we're giving them this information, man. That's why we put it up there. And look how sharp, 90 degree there, that sort of angle. That's a brilliant piece of work. That is right next to the other two. We've got a story here. This is an Egyptian story about them coming here and we're giving them information. We give them, in, we give them an inheritance, our wisdom. Again, please, Evan. 
And then we come to, we're still skirting around the glyphs. We're always within a couple of k's. This one's only about one and a half away. Yep. Most dangerous site I've been to, I hate it. I'll never go back. You have to basically, to get there, it's on a cliff face like this. It's a massive construction weighing hundreds of tons. And to get to it, you've got to jump from about, about here to where this young lady sits there. And if you miss it, you die. You roll down the hill 200 metres and you die because you can't stand up. When you get around that place, you can't stand. You will crawl around on all fours until you get inside. Now, what's interesting, there's three walls inside here. Klaus Duna sent us to this place. No one would find it. We just went there because he told us to go there. And what we've got are three walls. But what's interesting, ladies and gentlemen, that wall is 292 centimetres, that one's 293, and that one's longer, but it's down a hill a bit. And together they make a perfectly flat plane. And on top of it is a sandstone shelf of about 100 ton. What's that doing there? But you might think, oh, it's just natural. Well, let's have a look at it. That's the brickwork. That doesn't look natural to me because there's mortar there, by the way. If you got a cigarette paper, you wouldn't get it in there. You'd swear that these pictures come from South America, wouldn't you? No, they don't. They come from Carrion. They come from Carrion. Can you see how they're stacked on top of one another and there's a shelf on top again? Outside there, ladies and gentlemen, it's like that. And this thing is collapsing. Because I knew where I was going. We knew what we were looking for. Klaus had sent us this and we knew what we were looking for, didn't we? There was a chamber and those three walls led in. And they went in. And there was only one scrawny stick amongst us which was me. <laughs> so guess who got to go in? I got in about oh, 15 metres. Yep. Oh, man. It just wasn't very good from then on. I'm looking, I'm thinking, it's gone like that. I couldn't get any further in. We went in from the top and we stumbled onto what, Evan? Uh, it's a trap. It's a trap. We went on the top, man. There's a trap there. And we stopped. And we've never been back there. Because the trap was there. And we, we said, I stopped. We, there were things there that were so wrong when we got down there, weren't there? That wasn't right, and we just walked away from it. So we haven't been back to it. That's only a kilometre away. Now, I'm starting to give you a feel for the area. You see, when, when these archaeologists say, oh, the glyphs are rubbish, they don't put it in context. You put things in context, you get a better idea. Explain to me how that happened naturally. And tell me, would a European go and make that? Those, each of those blocks weigh about four times. Who would do it on the side of a hill? I'd ask you that. Would that be hard on any time? And it would be be damn impossible. You couldn't do it today, but it's there. Okay, and we'll go on with the next one. What's next? Star markers. Around there, by the way, this area's got more star markers than anywhere else in the world. There's one platform I'm going to show you, which is the next one up, is it not, Evan? Yes. Okay, next one coming up. We're charting it. There's 800 on one platform. We've done 380. And of course, we found two systems. What do they be? Orion and Pleiades. Of course they were there, that was a given, wasn't it? Now each one of those star markers, I need to tell you something about them, each one of those star markers is given to a person, a male, when they're initiated, and that is their constellation, that is their star, and they learn it back to front. Now they make perfect maps, better maps than you could make today of constellations, and I'll show you one. This one. This is a star map that's directly above the glyphs. Um, there was a gentleman talking to me about this before. And that we thought, we'd heard rumours that someone got it dated by Sydney Uni. And it came out to be 4,600 years, which is exactly when Khufu was around, which is when the two sons came here. It would have been great confirmation, but we heard rumours about it. We thought, ah, it's not going to happen. Lo and behold, we got sent this in the post. Oh, Gavin did, didn't he? And it actually is a map. And lo and behold, ladies and gentlemen, it says here that is dated at 2,000... 500 BC. 15th of July. Hey? 15th of July. 15th of July. We know the time it was done. Do you know what that adds up to be? 2,100, 2,500, and we got the 4,600. This is exactly the time when the two Egyptians were supposed to turn up there. And that star chart above is directly above the glyphs. Why did they put it there? to mark out this moment when the Egyptians first came to Australia, 4,600 years ago. That's why it's there. And we still haven't gone to the glyphs. Let's keep looking. Ah, you do know about, you guys have seen the first one. Have you seen the other sets of glyphs? 
Ah, you see, you know why? If there were more sets of glyphs, the whole story about some crazy man doing it wouldn't work, would it? Well, there are. Now, these glyphs are much smaller. They're not cut as hard, but I, we've been able to read them because they're all Proto-Egyptian, and we know exactly what it says. And down the bottom here is the clangor, that one. That means back door or back shaft. It's a story about someone dying, being buried in the back door or the back shaft. Now, ladies and gentlemen, is there a back door or a back shaft to carry on? Of course there is. It's all been filled in by National Parks and Wildlife, but there's the pictures of what they filled in. That is directly beside the glyphs, one half a metre behind. There's the first one. I've got two pictures of one. There's the second one. Now, for a long time, National Parks and Wildlife said that was a natural formation. They stopped. That was pretty obvious. You couldn't. You couldn't keep saying that's a natural formation. They have now given an official explanation for who did it. Now, it's not the deranged Czech, whose name we don't know. It's not the Sydney Uni students, whose names we don't know. This time, we do have a name. It was made by vandals. That's official. And they cleaned it out too. I would like to contact the National Parks of my life and find these vandals. I've got a lot of work on our farm I'd like done for nothing. And they'd be the right people to do it because they cleaned their work up because they dug all that out and cleaned all the mess away. They're damn good vandals and the best part is they didn't tag it. And as you know, vandals never tag anything, do they? They don't do that sort of stuff. So it was done by vandals, but in context, it's ridiculous because I've shown you the other parts that go around there. And now we're going to go a bit further. I know where we're going next, Kit. Okay. Then we come up to this one, and then we go on to the... My whole hand is turning blue, the whole finger. Yeah, it's bloody red. Okay, then we come up to the next two. We come up to this thing here. This has been analysed by the top laboratory in Australia. The reason is I play tennis with him, so he owed me a favour. So what we found is this particular thing here, Arnie Mini Mace found this next to the shaft. If you look very carefully, ladies and gentlemen, there was a clasp, a circular clasp that went around there. It got broken. Aunty Minnie's uh, daughter, I think, went to a doof and was dancing and broke it. Don't take 4,500-year artefacts to doofs or discos, please. It's not a good idea. So, but we had it analysed. And this is interesting. Not as interesting as a ring, but we're going there next. Analysis. 73% aluminium, 3% copper, 24% metals are unidentified on this planet. That's according to the top laboratory in Australia. A quarter of the, whatever's in there, they don't recognise as anything. And this, I've met this guy many times. He said, we've been talking about it and talking about it and talking about it. We can't work it out. Do you realise that every aluminium alloy made in the world is 85% or larger? This is 73%. And then it's got copper in there. They don't put copper in with aluminium anyway. And what's the other 24%? We don't know. That was found at Carrion, which is 33 degrees. I think we're going off on a tangent now, aren't we? I hope so. Uh, forget that. That was a bone that was found there too. Okay, I've had that analysed and they told me it's an ancient bone. We won't worry about that. That's not that interesting. Well, that actually is, but uh, we have that. <coughs> what's the time, please, Evan? I just want to time myself a bit. I'm not getting there. Good. Glad we got this in. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm wearing this right now and the whole of my hand's gone blue and it's actually, see how much sweat's on there? Yeah. Ever since I put this on, on, the ring on my finger, and I've had it on before, my hands are just covered in sweat. I'm going to have to take it off for a while. Okay. The story about this thing is quite amazing. I got a phone call from a lady, a um, few people in this name. Uh, room know quite well known Roz and she's the one who bought the rocks for us and she's got plenty of rocks for us, she's been working for a few years. She rang me up and said, I've seen this ring and I've been called to it. And she said to me, what do, you, what, what do you want me to do? And I know what I wanted to do. I nearly told her, don't bother. I don't do rings. I do, we do, we do rock stuff and we do, okay, we're doing skulls now. We didn't want to do it, we're doing them. But we don't do rings because rings in Australia, we, blackfellas, we don't make rings, so it's not something we do. And she said, I'm going to buy it. I said, well, all right, okay, good. She did. It meant nothing to me. And then she sent it to me, and it was a bit cryptic. When she sent it to me, she said, it keeps disappearing all the time. And I didn't really take that in at the time. And she said, it wants to come with you, I'm going to send it down. So she did. And it sat there for four months. 
and I just didn't want to do it. And finally, I said, oh, Christ, I'm going to go. Look, Ross has done so much for us, hasn't he? Richard, I've got to do that article on the damn thing. What am I going to write about a ring? So anyway, I get the ring, and I've got a readout. She's got a readout. Had a readout done, and I'm going to tell you the full story in a bit. And um, I looked into... Evan wasn't there, because Evan does all the research. I don't touch the computers. I don't go near them. Not even mobiles when it comes to that. Nothing. He gives me all the information. I don't get it. He wasn't there that day. So I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to do research on the computer on my own. Yeah, I was surprised to hear that there. It's never happened before. I thought, this is going to be ridiculous. Anyway, so I did. And I knew what the five things involved in this are. It's made up of copper, zinc, nickel, lead, and iron. And I know the percentages. And I knew that back to front. So I put those things up on the computer thing. And that's what you do, don't you? And then things come up. Well, I put the things up and nothing come up. There was cadmium in one and there was something in the other. And I tried everything. I looked and looked and looked. There was one register, Wikipedia, but I wasn't going there. I've got, some, I've got class. I'm not going near Wikipedia. No way. Three hours. I'm looking and looking. And it keeps coming up, Wikipedia, all the time. I said, oh, Right, I've got nothing else. I'm going to Wikipedia. They even got an article on us, haven't they? I wish pseudo... Whatever it is, it's not good. Anyway, there we go, and I find out, my God, we've got the same order as what I've got. And I read the story, and then I saw these words like Pliny the Elder, Plato, Herodotus. I thought, well, hang on for a sec. Even though it's Wikipedia, I'll listen to what they've got to say. And it turns out they start talking about this thing. This, this ring here, and they start by saying, plenty of the elders said in the first century BC, all the mines are exhausted. There's none left. It's called orichalcum. You won't see it on the periodic table. It's an alloy. You won't see it written anywhere because it's a mythical metal. It's a mythical metal that is associated with a place called Atlantis. And, of course, Atlantis is mythical and so is orichalcum. But in 2015... They found a Roman shipwreck, 6th century BC, and in it was Orichalcum. And it had exactly the same five things in the same order. But there were some differences. I thought, OK, fine, we've got somewhere here. We're starting to work this out. Then I started to read what Plato had to say. Now, Orichalcum was only ever used in Atlantis. Now, that Roman galleon that was wrecked in the 6th century, plenty of the elders said in the 1st century the mines were exhausted. That was probably the last mine they were mining that was Atlantean, and they were mining it. And we saw pictures of They put it in their most valuable coins. It's like gold, same colour. And we had saw some ingots, didn't we? Yeah. And they look exactly like gold. So there we are. We've got that. We know that it's all gone. So from 2,000 years on, it doesn't exist anymore. So here's the trick. Is it Roman? Well, it could be because the Romans had some. But they were ingots and coins, so there were differences. So... We looked at it and said, OK, where do we go next with this? And the next thing we found out was that there were symbols on that ring, the symbols of the clue. And we found that one of the symbols, which is um, this one here, we did find it. It was underneath the Berbers. And it's a Berber symbol for Atlas. He was the son of Poseidon, which is the word Landis comes from. And that is his symbol. So we then knew that four of the nine symbols are Atlas. OK, that was one. But we didn't know what the other symbol was. But we worked it out. The other symbol is made of five circles. You can see one, two, three there with straight lines both ways and then lines leading in. So it's got a circle with straight lines. Five circles. And we went back to Plato. And do you know how many rings there were in, in the centre of Atlantis? Five. Three of water, two of land. I thought, that's interesting. So I've got five rings, they've got five rings. And then I found out the roads that went in went in straight and across. Now I've got two sets of lines, straight and across. So I'm suggesting to you that those five rings represent Atlantis. The other four represent Atlas. And therefore, this must come from Atlantis. It can't come from a Roman place. So we have a ring now that is supposedly mythical. Well, it's not mythical. It's over there now sitting on a rock. It is actually a real rock, a real ring. Now, the trick with that is this was found. And I'll tell you the story about where it was found. The gentleman who found it was a miner. 
and he went to a place called Hill End, which is near Bathurst, and it's a gold mining area. And what happened was he got a brand new metal detector, $8,000, and they were going to go mining. And now they're looking for it, aren't you? Gold. So they camped that night at Hill End, and there was a hill, and I'm not going to mention the name of the hill because if I do, everyone and their dog's going to be there digging it up. So we won't do that part, and I've got a picture of it, I know where it is. It's on 33.003 degrees, where the hill is. 33 degrees, which is where Carrion is. That's why I'm bringing this together. It goes together. That hill, he went up there. What they did is they got drunk that night on Friday night, and they celebrated what they were going to find. Mike went. We back? Okay. Okay, so what happened was he went there. What he did was they celebrated. Now, he got pretty written off, he told me, that night. He woke up in the morning and he felt pretty seedy. He thought, my God, I've got two days of pan and digging for gold here. I need to clear my head. So he picked up the metal detector on a whim, no planning, and decided to walk up the hill and see what happened because there's no track there and there's no gold there. No one goes up there. And he knew that. He just wanted to do it for the sake of doing it. Well, that's what he thought. Halfway up there, he gets a reading. And he digs down a metre. Nothing there. Gets the thing back, puts it over the top. It's still going really big. Goes down another half a metre. He's down one and a half metres, 55, 56 inches. We work on one inch per thousand years. This is on the side of the hill, so sedimentation and laying down there is going to take a long time. It's around 30 to 40,000 years where he hits it. That's where it's found. He's going to put his name up. He's been back there with his metal detector looking for more. Looking for more. Now, I want to tell you a story. What happened was... He had this ring for five years and he went to Melbourne. He got a phone call when he was in Melbourne from the police. Someone's burgled your house. Your car's gone. Your place has been burgled. He races back up to his house and goes back to the black pouch that the ring is in, which we don't have at the moment, and guess what? The pouch is on the ground. The ring's gone. Only thing in the house that was stolen was the ring. Oh, the car. When they took the ring, they took his car. This is where it gets interesting. The car only went 200 metres down the road and it crashed. <laughs> now, no one was chasing him. The police didn't know it was happening. I mean, who cares about a copper ring anyway? They wouldn't chase the police. The police didn't know there was a burglary taking place. It crashed. And these guys ran out of the car and it got badly crashed up too and they sprinted off. He came back two days later and the car still had you know, the tape around it, crime scene, that sort of stuff. He walks around there, walks around the car seat door on the other side, and on the ground there, guess what's sitting there waiting for him? The ring. It's been there for three days. And I said, mate, was it easy to see? I saw it straight away. He said, what about all the people walking past it? Well, they didn't see it. I was waiting for him. I waited for him to come back. Now, when it was with Roz, Roz was telling me, and I spoke to her recently, she said it just kept disappearing. It would go for three or four days. Now, Roz, as you know, Richard, Roz is autistic. She told me I'm autistic. I know where I put everything. I know where it is. And I kept telling my husband, and after a while my husband realised it. My God, it is disappearing all the time. And when it come back, it told Roz to come back down to us. So, where are we now? We have the ring. The interesting part of this story is, what do you do with it? What do you do with it? Well, here's the trick. That night, when I sat down after I heard all that, I started by looking at this ring. When I get a new rock, I walk around with it for days, don't I, Evan? Yeah. I hold it. I don't want to look at it. I just want to feel where it's coming from to begin with. With a ring, where do you put it if you're going to work out where a ring comes? On your finger. Shouldn't have done that. <laughs> but we did. We put it back on our finger. I put it on my finger. I had it for a day and a half until I found out what, what the story was it is. We've now been given a lot of information about that ring. We're told it was made in Atlantis by two women and one guy. And we've also we've learned a lot more in another respect, ladies and gentlemen, because we now know three rings were made in Atlantis. Now, I know that's going to sound like a book that some of you guys might have read, <coughs> Lord of the Rings, but can I tell you something? Tolkien went and worked this off a Scandinavian myth. What's that myth about Atlantis and its collapse? Think about that for a sec, because I'll tell you how this goes. Three rings were made. We started researching this. And there is another ring that's been used. And you all know about it, but nobody knows about it. A gentleman by the name of Howard Carter, who went to Tutankhamun's tomb, who was the next offspring of Khufu, 
And 17 people went in there and 16 died and Carter didn't. Do you know why he didn't die? Well, we do. We found out. You do? Well, don't tell them. Let me do it. <laughs> we found out. We researched it. Howard Carter read an account by Marquis de Agrin, a French archaeologist who found the Ring of Atlantis, that's what they called it, at Luxor, in 1870, and he brought it back. And Marquis' granddaughter married someone, his name, Blazel, his name is, who started doing work on this ring. And he made the claim that the shape and the markings on the ring repelled all negative energy, whether visible or invisible. Well, everyone thought he was an idiot, but Carter didn't. Carter went across to France and spoke to him. They said, it's the shape. We will make you a ring that is exactly the same shape as that. And they gave it to Carter. And when he put it on that night, he had a dream. This is true, by the way. The dream was he would make a great discovery in Egypt when he had the ring on. Soon after, he went there. And soon after, he came back and lived for 30 years after. Did anyone else live past six months? No. Why did he live when they didn't? Because he wore the ring. Now, that is a copy. I've seen pictures of Carter. Have a look. It's on that finger for the rest of his life. We know someone in the family, don't we? Yeah. It was passed on to the auntie, who wore it like I do, as a necklace, then passed on again. It's only a copy, but they treat it like gold. The original is the pure ring of good. There's no evil in it. There is a second ring, not this one. The second ring is the opposite. It's evil. Tolkien spoke about that ring. I'm afraid there's a difference. I don't believe the people who have the good ring know how to turn it on, because we don't either. We've got another ring. I'll tell you where that sits next. The evil ring will not be made. Ours is made from copper, zinc, and stuff like that. The first ring thing is made from clay, from the earth. That's why it's a woman's ring. That's why it's good magic. The other ring. The evil ring will be made from other metals, not ours, but they will be metals that are more conducive to being evil. Like our ring, unlike the ring in the boat, which was, I think, the copper content was up to, down to 75%, we're 73. The zinc content was 20%, we're 25. And the content of the other three trace elements were 5%. My trace elements are 0.5 of a percent. Because I believe my three trace elements were used homeopathically to create the magic within it. Now, here's the trick. I've got this ring. I've got all this information. I found out about Carter. I found out there's three rings. Am I going to start writing about this ring being magic? I knew about Sean and what happened to him. So I asked the ring and told the ring. I basically demanded. I gave it an ultimatum. If I'm going to talk about this, I want a sign. And it can't be a sign I can rationalise away. It has to be something where there's nothing else but the ring that could do it. And that night, that's exactly what happened. I'm not going to tell you about it because that's not important. If you don't believe a bit of the story about Sean, you're not going to believe mine anyway. But what I am going to tell you is for the first time ever, I've been prosecuting this magic part full on from that point on because the ring did something that made me never doubt it again. I don't need any more signs from that ring. My question is this. We gave it ceremony. It was interesting, the ceremony was all run around the numbers three, six and nine. We were told to give it a seven, another ceremony nine months from now and we've been told now the ring has been turned on. I'm getting stories of around three to nine percent turned on. It is actually aware and I'm doing something with some very close people tomorrow. We're going to try and test it a bit further. We've got some things we can do. I'm of the opinion that after we did the first ceremony with it and we were told what to do, I'm of the opinion we can now actually contact it and it can give us information and we'll find that out tomorrow. So that will be part of our next presentation, even when we do one on the ring. But what we have got there, ladies and gentlemen, let me just check there, oh, I see where we're going with this, is we've got a ring now at the moment. We are told it's part of something that I'm going to talk about before we get to, what time is it now? 20 minutes, okay, I'm going to get to it very soon. All right, quickly get off that now because I've got to do one thing. We were talking about carry on giving. I got lost. Okay, we go back to 33 degrees again. Now we've got a lot more context about 33 degrees and what that site means. That's a story, ladies and gentlemen. 
And I want to tell you this much. That part of the story is not Egyptian. It is not Egyptian. It's our language. We had a language before the Egyptians. You know where they got their hieroglyphs from? From us. That story there, which Evans put up, that is 42% Proto-Egyptian and 58% no one can identify it because it's the first language again. The first language can be done in stone arrangements up our way or it can be put on the wall for those people who want it simpler. Either way, and it doesn't work because they put them both in Australia and we don't look at either of them. They left them there for a reason. Next one, please, mate. Okay, more of the narrative, and by the way, you'll, as you go through that, that's the Egyptian part, that is fair income, that's about two brothers being stranded. That is on a different wall. There's a, a roof above that one. The walls that don't have roof are different narratives to that. The people who've gone there and started reading Egyptian and tried to read it into the rest, and then got, all fell apart because it didn't fit in properly. That's why. They didn't understand properly. There's two different stories there. And then they complained and said the Sorex, the cartouches, they're really Sorex, are facing the wrong way. They are. And at that stage when they found it, nothing had been done like that. We found pottery on inscriptions made by Thoth, where all of the Sorex are reversed. It's sacred language. We have eight reversed Sorex at that site. That makes it incredibly sacred. Eight, not one. They thought it was a mistake. It was a blessing. And there's the beginning of the original narrative, but I'm not going to talk about that today because I'm going to do that later on. Another time. Go past that, Evan. And we're going to finish with this. Do you want to know when it happened? I can tell you when that was put in. There's your clue. And what do we do there? Do we go to the glyphs? No, we go near the glyphs again because we're trying to get a contextual take on this. And there you will find the same type of engraving. Each of those cuts is straight and pure, and down the bottom it's flat. There are eight of them. That is north, south, east, west. It's, the, it's a compass. It's a perfect compass. And see the circle in the middle. See that one there for N for north. See how finely it's cut. That circle in the middle wasn't chiseled. It was cut like that. We got, uh, the guy that found this got a professor from Newcastle Uni. An engineer. An engineer from Newcastle Uni. He said we can do it in the laboratory, but we couldn't do it on field. So what you're looking at there, an expert said we can't do it on the field yet, but we can now do it in a laboratory. This is out in the middle of the bush in the middle of nowhere. See that mark across there? White fella archaeology. Bulldozer track. Went over the top of it. Didn't even see it. Didn't even see it. But here's the clue. We can date it. Because the north, see where the north is? North ain't there. That's not where north is now. It's 15 degrees east, it's moved. Now that means one of two things, that somebody's gone into the bush with technology no one in the world has and done this where no one can see it and walked away but couldn't read a compass. But it's got a technology that no one in this world has yet but can't read a compass and made a mistake doing it. And the other point is why would you do it? Where's the point? Why would you do that? So what do we know? That's ancient. Because when was the world, when was the world, when did we last have a shift of 15 degrees from where it is now? It's been a while, I can tell you this much, it's before Cook. So therefore it's before Cook, then it don't fit into their story, does it? If unless the earth has moved in the last 200 years, which it hasn't, 15 degrees east, then this is pre-Cook. And the question you've got to ask is, what technology was used to cut that? So ladies and gentlemen, what we've done is we've done a very, very short trip down the coast on one theme, which is the people who came here. And I think we're now leading up to the whole point of this, aren't we? Yes. Okay. Now, where's the point in all this? There is a point. Blackfellas, we don't have history that goes in a straight line. Our history goes like this. We don't have a start and finish. It just goes round and around and around. The hoop's complete. This is what this is about. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the time I've got left, I'm going to explain to you why this is important. About two years ago, I got a phone call from an elder. He told me they're coming. And I said to Brendan, 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 what do you mean they're coming? I've got this from the middle, from the elders from the middle. They've held a ceremony about this. They called them. I said to Brendan again, Brendan, could you just give me a few more details at the moment, mate? You leave me a bit shorter. He said, we sung them up. They came before and they're coming again. I said, who? The Pleiadian? He said, yeah, they're coming. I said, well, what's the story with this? He said, well, it was when 
basically it's been building up for a while. They sung them. I know a couple of groups have called them. And I think to an extent one of the things that had to happen is the seven sisters had to get back in order. There's somebody who just raised their forehead when I said that. And that's been done. That's been done. Now, what I've been told by elders all over the country that ring me independently of each other and tell me exactly the same story. Now, I remember when this started. I remember telling Richard at the time, I'm 40% or 45% convinced. And it's funny, between us, we've been discussing this for quite some time. I'm now up to about 90%. And I know Richard's sitting around the same number we argue about a bit, and I'll tell you why. Because elder after elder has told me exactly the same story, one variation. This is what they said. They came before and tried to help us and it didn't work. Well, we know about that. We've got them here now. That's why they're back. That's why they've been found. That's why this ring, where is it? <laughs> if I lose that, I'm, I'm deep shit. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't say that. That's why the ring was found. That's why the skulls have been found. That's why the rocks have been found because there's something going on. And here is what's supposed to happen. They're on their way. They're coming. And they're going to do one of two things. They're either going to come down or they're going to move past and never come back. It's up to you and I. And it's up to the people of this country alone. This is the rule. I've been told this is what's going to take place. They will come. Some elders say they will land on Uluru. Others say they hover above Uluru. It doesn't matter. I don't care. There's been, that's a major point of dissension. That's the only one. What isn't in dissension and what happens next? If there are the right number of people in this country, and they've even told me the number down to the one, they know exactly how many souls there have to be. If there are that many souls in this country when they come, they will feed off the energy of those enlightened souls. They will take that energy and amplify it and throw it into Uluru. That will re-energise that site. It will then go and hit five other sites around Australia, of which the first one is the Standing Stone site. If those five sites don't receive that energy, it doesn't spread. That is why the Standing Stone site is so important, because Uluru is there, and the other three are fine. The one site that's not ready is the Standing Stone site. That's why we've been involved in this. That's the main reason. Now, here's what happens. If the Uluru can charge the other five off, then that hits the grid going around the world. Now, if you check now, the elders from all over the world are announcing the awakening is coming. It's been said by the Hopi, by the Inuit, it's everywhere. It's not just common knowledge, it's known by all the elders. And I will tell you, it starts here first. Once those five sites are energised, the rest will be. Then what happens, according to all the elders, is there will be two realities on this planet. A lower reality, the Schumann Residence around seven, which we have most of the time, but some of you people might know, the Schumann Residence, the residence of this planet, has gone up to 150. It will stay there. It will stay at 150 forever. So we will then have two resonances running together. One at a lower resonance, that will suit the people who are still at that lower residence, be they CEOs, be they generals, whatever, and probably 99% of all the reptiles and quite a few others. All of those people will stay in that reality and they will walk past the people in the other reality and see each as shadows. But here's the real major point in this. The ones who are in the lower reality will see what, and know what's going on and will also know Science cannot work with two different realities at the same time. One must perish. And the lower reality per perishes. And here's the sting in the tail. I remember when I asked the elder the first time, I asked four of them the same question. So does that mean that the CEOs and the generals, they die, incarnate and come back? He said, no. This is a seminal point on this planet. The ones who don't get it right this time, bear in mind they've come back and they've come back and we've all come back. Everyone here has come back because we didn't get it right. They've lowered the bar this time. And if you can't get over the bar this time, when that reality dies, those souls perish with it. And this is a seminal time. And I'm told that reality includes more than half the population on this planet. It's a major event. The reason that skull I showed you before come was to put this place in order. Now, the last part of this story is the most important part. Why is it 
the beings from all over the cosmos are so concerned about us. It's because, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to share you with a story. I share a story with you, and this explains it really well. I took Graham Hancock, Evan and I took Graham Hancock out for four, five, six days on country on the agreement. He would spend one day with an elder, old way. And he did. And he saw this, didn't he, Evan? Yep. So what I'm saying now, if you don't believe it, ask Graham. I'll tell you the same thing. Carno came out and he wanted to give everyone a lesson. And he came up, done up old way, didn't he? Yep. Pain all over, lap, lap. Started singing, whispering song, all in language. Sometimes said a bit of English, didn't he? Yep. Then when he finished, after about half an hour, walked back a step. We saw him. Walked back a second step. We didn't see him. He was gone. Completely. He was gone. No one could see him. Turned up a while later, didn't he? Standing behind Christine, didn't he? Huge smile on his face. Loving every minute of it. And I asked the elders later. We found out later. He just said, it wasn't a trick. He said this. He said, what I did, every person on this planet can do. You see, you are supposed to be the spiritual ones, not the intellectual ones. You're not, never going to do it. You're never going to compete with the Pleiadians and others or even the mob that were here before. You can't beat them. That's not our role. We are supposed to be the shamans. That's what they look to us for. We lost our role. When I said we came with seven senses and fully developed, we've only got five now. The two main ones, telekinesis, clairvoyance, all those things go together. That's what we're supposed to be. And that's what was taken away from us. And here's the sting in the tail. That's what will be given back to us when the change comes. It's an awakening, ladies and gentlemen. It's the change where the indigenous people, we get our say. We've had five, six hundred years of the other mob, the cloners had their say. And this stuff has been going on now for six, seven thousand years. This business where men have taken over. And I must tell you in the future, there's a rule in the future. It is all matrilineal. The men may protect, but from the time this goes on, we never make another decision. It all becomes down to the women. That ring I've got there, I've been told. When the change takes place, it goes to the two women. I wear it now because I'm the warrior that protects it and I'll fight for it. When the change is finished, it goes back to the women, not the men. Our days are numbered and that's the rule that comes from this. When the change takes place, we lock into the feminine side and that's what this change is about, ladies and gentlemen. And indirectly, ladies and gentlemen, that is what the whole of this archaeology is about. It is archaeology but it's also our future. The skull comes from the past and they're coming again. So that's a circle that's complete. The ring was hidden here. I've been told that. It was hidden here because my understanding was Atlantis fell when two rings were worn by one person. The bad ring and the ring that is five ninths good and four ninths bad. This is in the middle. You put this on the same person, they run the world. And of course, we have had offers for this ring, haven't we? Yes, we have, yes. Yes. <laughs> Any, name your price. Name your price. And I'm sure the people saying that would be good people that would do the right thing by the ring and it would end up being worn by somebody that was reptilian, part of the Illuminati and probably running the whole damn show. And the reason why the world's in a mess today is because there are three rings but only one of them works. The second ring, we, we got it on three to nine percent. If it goes to 100%, I know what it can do to me. I know that it's magic, and I know that magic works to me. Can it work through the whole of the world? I have no idea. And do we know what's going to happen nine months from now? We've got no idea. But we know exactly what time it's going to be. It will be nine months to the minute when we do it. And of course, when we started this stream, it was 321, which is a multiple of three. Then we stopped again at 324. Then we finished again at 336, which all multiples of three. Was. And it's three times three months when it comes back. So the moral of the story is, ladies and gentlemen, very simply this. We were here. The Blackfellas were the first mob. The first mob. We begun this process. You mob here, if you're not black, you're supposed to come. I can tell you now, we lost our way 400 years ago. We needed the Whitefellas to come. I'm still telling my brothers and sisters that, and they don't get it. We had lost our way. All those rocks over there are men's rocks that were taken off the men, guarded by the women. We needed the white fellas to come here for ten generations to get our house in order. Ten generations are up. There's a change ahead. 
I can tell you now, a lot of my brothers and sisters who are black will not be coming with us. It's not a colour thing. I'm going to leave you with the last comment made by my elder. Remember this, as my elder told me time after time, spirit knows no colour. This is a head thing. Now your job is simple. When you leave this room, your job as what Kano called them, what did he call them, mate? Holy warriors. Holy warriors. Your job is to go and find those people sitting on the fence and tell them this stuff and they're going to look at you and say, you're crazy. Don't worry, do it anyway. It's called seed dreaming. You put the seed in, they may call you crazy one day, something happens the next day and they start to think again. You've got to plant the seed. The change is coming. Whether it's nine months from now when the, seed is, when the ring is called up, I don't know. But it's coming soon. You can ask any black fella in this country that knows about it, and I'll tell you, the same thing. They know it's coming. I know some people have gone bush. They don't have a house. They're just waiting. They're waiting for the change. They've walked away. I know Jinky's one, isn't she? No one can find her anymore. She said, I'm just, I'm a woman. I'm waiting for our time to come. She said, I can't spend any more time out here. I'm waiting the nine months in the bush, and I'll come out when it's happened. So, I might be right nine months from now. I'm going to look like an idiot. I won't get asked back, will we? <laughs> That'll be it. But on the off chance we're right, then that means this world will become heaven on earth again. Yes. And the people are here will all be on here for the same reason. No one's going to be in contention because it will be the golden age they spoke about. Down the line, I don't know. But that's what's coming. That's what we think. That's what the original people think. It's what the indigenous people think from all over the world. We're all preparing. And there's only one thing that can screw us up. If that standing stone site is not ready, a year from now, we have a problem. But we are in this process right now. We're sending two elders out. They're going to go around Australia and they're going to collect 400 signatures from the elders and we're going to demand that we get that site back. And then we're going to do some funding in Byron Bay and we're going to put it in the local papers and the national papers. We want $4 million, $3 million to buy the land back and $1 million to get the rocks back and put them back in the right place. Remember, we know where the rocks go. We know what they're called, we know the songs, and we can put the spirit back. And that will become the focal point of this country. So ladies and gentlemen, nine months from now, we could all be smiling. And if we're not, we'll carry on anyway. Thanks a lot for listening. Is it question time? Uh, yeah, let's do a little bit of question time. I've just lost the microphone down my trousers. <laughs> <laughs> the battery's not. Okay, the gentleman that's raised his hand up with the glasses and the black T-shirt. It's probably best we've got one operational mic, so stand up and really project. Scream. <coughs> okay. About symbols and numbers, Tesla thought that 3, 6 and 9 were important. Yes. The Masons have 33 degrees, which you talked about. Skull and bones are 333. What's the pattern? The pattern, out in our society, original people, every time we have a sign, it comes in threes. If there's going to be an elder that dies and one dies, we know two more will go. We are obsessed with three. Everything happens to us in threes. Everything we've done has happened in threes because it is the sacred number. And I don't know why that works because I don't get sacred geometry. I just get the truth and everything we are. You're right, three is everything. I don't know why that happens. Third time proves it, it does here. It does everywhere. I don't know why, because I don't do sacred geometry, but you're right. All right, Moira was first. Oh, you did. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Secondly, um, uh, yeah, uh, there is a ledge. If you're standing at the bottom of the glyph, mm. there's a ledge along the side. Mm, of I know it. And the, there's inscriptions there, mm. and there's a cleft, and it's obviously been falsely filled with stones. Yes, it has. They're stacked yeah, on top yeah. of one another.
It's proto-Egyptian, it means inheritance. Inheritance or mm. body Yes, I know. Mm. It's not a dog in the bone. No, and they did. I heard about that. They poured acid over the whole wall. Yeah, I did hear about that. Uh, yeah, so, and there are some other carvings uh, around that area. I found them. Yeah, did yeah. you find the one of Horus holding the man and the woman? No. No, no not that one. No, well, apparently a road worker, when they were building the Cowan Road, they had a service road, and they suddenly found on the cliff a life-size Oh, no. Oh, God. That's the end of it. Oh, why well, do I've been there? <laughs> okay. I know a lot about the Pyramid of Gimpy. We work with the Gubby Gubby a lot. We just got Dr. Samir to get up there to do a show on that. Um, there is some, ch we've heard rumours that because of the pressure that's been exerted, there is a possibility that they may go around the pyramid and not destroy it, but it's only a rumour. Okay, so I don't know, but I'm working constantly with Diane and the Gubby Gubby about that. They are fighting. I can tell you now that if the Traditional owner registered on the title deed goes on that site, he will be arrested and put in jail. He's already been charged for going onto his property. It's a long way to go. But we are fighting on that one, and there could be light at the end of the tumble on that particular place. By the way, it's not actually a uh, pyramid, it's a healing table. There's a table on the top that is as strong as a healing table at carry on. That's the important part of it. All right, Lee, stand up for Jack. <laughs> Good call. You're only saying what we're saying, they're coming. That's another way of validating the fact they're on their way. Right, this gorgeous looking man here with a marvellous moustache. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I like you too. It's from a big island. Wonderful lecture. But that, have they, or do they intend to do a, a facial reconstruction on, on the, uh, on the uh, our friends? Yeah, we've got, we've got a gentleman uh, we're chasing up that is, it, when we send the cast down to him, he will line up to put a, a face and, and the whole thing on that. He's made that offer. I think I mentioned that to you, didn't I, Richard? And as soon as we get another cast, we're getting the jaw put on it. As soon as we do that, we'll send him one down and we'll put the face on there. So that's on the way. But that all costs money. That's really expensive. And luckily, I've got a couple of people, because I don't have much of it. And a couple of people have helped a lot, one in particular. Mm. Was that because it's too tight or no. were you feeling so? Oh, no, it's loose as anything. Yeah. Oh, no, it's loose. So you were feeling some... Oh, no, it just reacts like that with me. You see, you've got to remember, it's a woman's ring, but I have been given permission to wear it. I'm the only male that's supposed to wear it anywhere. And I wore it from the start anyway. I actually asked someone, it was too late, and they said, way too late. I had it on too long. So, no, it'll tolerate me, and it'll tolerate me because it knows what I'm doing for it, but it doesn't mean it doesn't react with me. I mean, it started when I got in the... Plain, didn't it? It did, yeah. Started then, I had the hand where it's on, it just got covered and sweat all the time. But that's nothing unusual with it. It's, it's not a normal piece of work, so I've just got to remember where the bloody thing is, too. I keep forgetting it. Yeah, no, that's just um, what it does, and I'm fine with that. Hmm? Two women have worn it. It's fine. The two women were stip stip stipulated to wear it. They have both worn it, and they're quite comfortable with it. The ring's comfortable with them. 
But it was made very clear, if it was anyone other than those people, putting it in your hand is not an issue. Because we've worked out the power comes from the outside and spins. You put a crystal in the middle of it, it won't move. The same with the other one. It's the shapes on the outside that work. So putting it, like, when you do it like I do now, it actually knows you. Yeah, well, look, one of them said the first, but one woman who put it on, when she put it on, the first thing she said is, my God, this feels like I had this on before. That was her first reaction. And that was the first thing she said, I've had this on before. And she was forced to put it on. She was told by others, you are supposed to put it on, so it wasn't a voluntary thing. In fact, I was told two days before this woman could wear it. I didn't tell her. I didn't want to. But another person, the other person who could wear it, told her she could. So yeah, two, re two women at the moment, one male, which is me. Once the awakening, two women only, no male. I get to look at it. Okay. My days are over. Yes. The arm. Oh, sorry, the be oh, sorry, I didn't mention that. Yeah, look, very quickly, what happened was Jack told me this when he was there. They found a boat, an Egyptian boat there, and it was written about by a lot of people. But what Slater said, I wish I'd found the boat, but I did find the, the stone anchors. Now, it's very important. Stone anchors, the ones they're talking about, stopped 3,000 years ago. So they found these two stone anchors. We know the name of the person who found it. He's seen them, um, and he gave it to someone. He had it for a while and gave it to someone else in Brunswick. But that was in 1955, yeah. and I think he's dead. They, no, no, they found it. According to this gentleman, it was found where this, it was, uh, there was no water there, but 4,000 years ago there was. It was found half a mile from the Standing Stone site and closer to the creek. And the anchor and the boat were there. The boat was taken away. And I would say that's probably in Sydney Uni, down with the other stuff that someone else mentioned about. It's probably down in the bowels there. But the anchor is still somewhere in Brunswick Heads. We know about that, but we don't know where it is at the moment. So that was in the notes. And everyone's seen it. It was written about a lot of times. All right, we've got three more questions. There will be time downstairs for a little while with these two extraordinary gentlemen. So more questions. Three more. Come on. <laughs> You've got it in you. I know it. I can feel it. Yes. Like an auctioneer. We'll do this gentleman first. <laughs> Yeah. More about that yeah, I do. They found anything? Yeah, I do. They can't get here. Um, Mohammed Ibrahim. We lined it up. Yeah. Um, he was going to come and do a talk with us. Um, the Egyptian government gave him permission to leave. The Australian government, Mohammed Ibrahim, has got a PhD and he's got a job. The Australian government said if he comes to Australia, he could be a terrorism risk and he might oh, abscond. Oh and then run off into the area there so we can't have him coming. He's got a PhD in hieroglyphs, right? He's got a job there. He's got a family there. He's living all the time. The government thought he could be a terrorism risk, so they wouldn't let him in the country. It's a pack of lies. It's because he would have actually... He's already told us the glyphs are legitimate, and he wanted to say it because no one who can read hieroglyphs has ever been here. So if they get him to come, it messes it up, doesn't it? So he's a terrorism risk. You know what it is. You're Muslim. They're all terrorism risks, according to him. So, no, we can't get him here. He'd love to come, and he knows it's legit. Yeah. Can't get here, but got a problem. That is frightening, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just the, the photograph where you're standing on top of the mound of the standing stones, and mm. you look out, and you can see the three pyramids. Mm. Yeah, yeah. What area is that? It's in a place called, near a place called Mullumbimby. Yeah, Mullumbimby. Mm. But I won't be more specific than that because I promised the farmer at the very start I would never give up his location. Virtually everyone knows where it is, don't they, Evan? Yeah. But I've never given it up and I won't. But it's in Mullum, not far from there. And, and people didn't go to Mullum Bimby for no reason. No. You know what I mean? no. Uh, okay, one more question out there. No. Oh. oh, yeah, there we go. We've got two, so we'll do. There is a picture on uh, one of the sites about the glyphs. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, well, the, the story is, the real story is the dog ran up the, the bottom part and he chased it in there. But it was filled in. But it was filled in. What happened was, what he did is, when, you, when it's filled in, what you can see, and David Fitzgerald told me, because he was a National Parks and Wildlife Aboriginal site officer at the time, when he got there, he had to bribe his way to go and look at it, and they saw it later in the evening. He was told not to tell anyone on threat of being sacked straight away, as they all were. Um, they could see some glyphs at the top. Yeah, up the top. Yeah, but that's all he could see. And that's what the guy saw with the, the dog. And when they came in there, all they could see was that David was involved with a gang of six men that took three days to clear it out. So the idea of a deranged check walking there three years before is a lie because no one could walk in there. Now, I had the impression that he walked through, hmm. um, there was a, a roof on it. There was. The roof fell. The roof apparently fell in the 1950s. It was cracked. Apparently a bulldozer went over the top and broke it. Mm. In the rest. Yeah, it was filled up. It was filled up. So it's a lie to say someone walked in and did that because they couldn't. Until David cleaned it out, no one could get in. Yep. That's the point. He cleaned it out in 1978. Nas the National Parks and Wildlife said they found it in 1982. There's a five year gap. And I do know for a fact that during that time, one person within National Parks Life was given the job of destroying the site. And at one stage, it was going to be used for artillery practice for the Australian Army. And she blocked it and blocked it and blocked it and she promised last year when she resigned she'd pull the whole thing up, give up the whole story because she was the person who covered it up. And she promised she'd do it and she didn't and her husband left her the next day because her husband said you had to do it and she, he wouldn't stay with her any longer. She would have spilt the whole thing out because she actually became the head of National Parks and Wildlife and other parks somewhere else so she was the top of the list. She was the one who covered it up, I know the full story of that. And she was given money, a slush fund to destroy it. So that's part of the truth. That's the real story. Okay. And I said, ah, we got one more. Right, one more, just the lady down the back. <laughs> yes, you. Stand up, darling. Project. Project. No, it's you. It's you. Believe me. Um, I noticed you've got some rocks here from the side. Is there any crystals or rocks that you've found on the side that cannot be explained? Oh, gotcha. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, I've got rocks here. I, I've got rocks here that I would never bring in this room. I've got rocks that will kill people. And I don't know how that works, but I've been, I've been told when we put, give all the rocks and put them in a portal, I get to keep four of them. They're the worst rocks that no one in the country wants. They're mine. I get the rubbish. They get all the pretty stuff. Yeah, there are, there's a lot of rocks here we don't understand. I don't do crystals because crystals are women's stuff. I do rocks. The crystals basically belong to women. The women look after the crystals, the men look after the rocks. And then the rocks were taken off us because we played up. We end up with nothing. Thank God the white fillers came. Would have been a mess without us, wouldn't we? And that's it.